attention here at the center. You know, the line of sight is um, better the closer in you are. So if people feel like moving closer in, um, you might have a better day. Let the people who come later suffer. Um, my name is Sarah Bartlett. I am the dean of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, we started in 2006, and we have two master's degrees and a third on the way. Um, one is our master's in journalism. One is a master's in entrepreneurial journalism, which was the first of its kind in the nation. And in January, we're aiming to launch a master's in social journalism. Um, two of those three are under the auspices of the Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism. We have two other centers here as well, one on, uh, for community and ethnic media and one for the McGraw Business Journalism Center. I'm going to get out of the way really fast here just to say I hope you have a great day. Um, we have a fabulous facility. Bathrooms are down that way in case anybody wants to know. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Jarvis who um, conceived of this wonderful day and, and with his team has organized a, an amazing series of presenters. So with no further ado, Jeff Jarvis. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, welcome all. Uh, this is uh, an important day. Uh, because we come not to bury TV, but to reinvent it. And, and we want to rethink what TV can be. And I think the timing, as you'll hear from, from Amy at Pew, Amy Mitchell at Pew, is very right. Uh, the desperation that newspapers went through and magazines went through uh, starting 20 years ago, uh, TV kind of stood back and said, no, no problem, we're OK. Uh, but I'm starting to hear the rumblings out there. And you can look at that uh, with the doom and gloom that hit our print confrères, but you can look at that in another way which is that there's an opportunity to reinvent what we have here and to rethink TV with new opportunities, new ways to do things. Um, you know, desperation is the parent of you know what, of, of, of innovation. And so a little desperation, a little fear is not a bad thing. So Amy will scare you shortly, I think, uh, with some of her stats, uh, which is important to look at, look at where we are. Um, I said we don't want to bash TV, but I suspect that there is welling up in some of you a few thoughts uh, that may not be the most positive and flowery about TV. So I want to get all, all the bad juju out for a few minutes here and give you a chance real quickly around the room to say what drives you nuts about TV news now. And then once that's over, it's banned for the rest of the day, okay? Rest of the day is about opportunity and positive, what we can do, but what, what bugs you about TV news? I'll start the ball rolling. What bugs me most about TV news is the location stand-up, where nothing has fucking happened for 12 hours, <laughs> right? I'm here to tell you that the, the police this morning are somewhere else doing something else, but they're, they're gone now. The most ridiculous example of this was the Chris Christie, George Washington Bridge stand-ups, where journalists and trucks and expense and resources went to the GW Bridge and stood there. There were no sources, no victims, no officials, no journalism to be done there but it treated the world as a background to what we did. I hate that. I want to get rid of that. All right, lightning round, three minutes, real fast. Throw your hand up, I'll run to you. What drives you nuts about TV news? It's the way that as soon as you put a microphone in front of your face, you talk differently. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, you don't have an accent, right? No, not at all. <laughs> oh, no, okay, all right, hold on. Excuse me. Intense superficiality. Ah, plastic people. What else? Oh, come on. Yes, yeah, sorry. Here we go. All right, real quick. Uh, clueless reporters who don't know what they're reporting on. Overuse of irrelevant B-roll. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm walking nowhere right now for the sake of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Pundits on one side of the room and the facts on the other. Ah. Mistakes don't matter. We just go on. What was the last time you saw a correction? Yes. Fox News. Ah, well, we could, that only took two minutes to happen. Who else? Who else? OK. The inappropriate or excessive use of music. Ah, OK. You don't like music? Oh, geez. Kill the theme show. Letting people get away without actually answering the question that you asked them. Ah. Such as? <laughs> All right, smart ass. In case you ju you're just tuning in, I'm going to repeat what I just said five minutes ago. 
well, or more than that too, <clears throat> I don't know anything new, but I'm gonna keep on acting like it's new because it's breaking news all the time. Anybody else? Okay. Cutting down the facts to fit an artificially sized news hole. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody going once? Going twice? We're okay, okay. Oh, Fred. Creating logos so they can brand disasters and events. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, that's it. Okay, that's, that's your quarter for the day. We got it out of our systems. Now we're going to move on to what's positive. Um, Alistair, could you put up my one slide? Is it there or is it, you have it? I want to talk for a moment about what TV can do well, right? Because I think that, that it has unique properties. Video, I want to call it video, but it was beyond video now. It's, but if you look at TV, what can do well? So this is my quick list. Amend it as you will. TV can, and I, know, I tell my students, never read a slide. I'm about to read the slide. Uh, but, but TV can bring people together. It has that power, especially now. How do we use that power well? Um, I think it can summarize well to a fault, right? It summarizes the whole world in nothing, but that's a skill of TV. That has value. Um, curation, it does that without so much giving credit where it got stuff, but it has the power to pull together a lot of things. <laughs> TV should be great at explaining things. And you'll hear from one of our, uh, our graduates later on today about an idea around that. TV can demonstrate things. How does this thing work? What does this look like? To me, the the best use of TV graphics I ever saw was Tim Russert's whiteboard, right? Because it was simple and it demonstrated something and made it clear to me. Um, TV should be and could be collaborative, highly collaborative. I will throw in my own idea a little later around that idea. Yes, goddammit, TV can discuss and discuss and discuss and discuss, and it does that disgustingly now. I said I wasn't going to be negative. Um, but TV could bring a lot of voices to an issue and, and could do that well. Um, it can bring in new voices. I'll be negative one more time here. When um, Piers Morgan was fired, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, from CNN, uh, the president of CNN said that uh, they got rid of that show because there weren't enough people to interview. There were only so many gets to be had, big gets. There are billions of people around the world, and they're interviewing the same two dozen people all the time. It, it spoke volumes about what TV is doing. TV can certainly humanize, humanize to a fault, but in a world of institutional voices in print, humanity matters and comes out. It can become two-way, we'll talk about that. I think this is a really, really important one. TV does not have to fill a clock. That whole idea of breaking news, tell you, you know, loop the video so you don't go away, well, online, you can make an asset that has value and then, and then leave it until something new actually happens. That's different. That's an opportunity that we have in video. And, and, and in that same way, TV can build assets. It can build things that don't just become digital fish wrap, but that people come back to. And I think that's very important. So you can get rid of the slide if you want, Alistair. Um, so what we wanted to do today, we're going to hear from uh, Jason Mojica from um, Vice News. And of course, Vice News is always here to be controversial and say outrageous things. And, uh, and, and I'm sure he's too nice a guy to do that, but we'll try to goad him into it. Amy Mitchell is going to scare you or inform you, take your choice of how you look at that, about where life stands. She has to get on a train, so we're going to be prompt. And then, this is a real risky experiment we're doing. 24 of you uh, have volunteered to present a vision for what TV news can be in only, and he hates me for this, three to five minutes, fully. Not because we want to make the world into sound bites as TV does, but because we wanted to get 24 ideas in. And what we want this to be is the first of many events about reinventing TV news and rethinking what it can be. It's a positive exercise. We have now a class here, Travis Fox, my colleague here at CUNY, will tell you about our laboratory in reinventing TV news uh, in a little bit but it's something that we're trying to make a priority at the school. So this is the first, I hope, of many events where we're going to reimagine the possibilities for TV. Um, and then at the end of the day, 
we'll have some folks from big old TV, I see one over there and I see one here, who will react to what they've heard and also give us some insight about um, how difficult it can be to innovate in this world. What are the, what are the challenges they have? What do we need to do? Um, so before I move on, I want to thank very much uh, some folks for their help with this event. Uh, Fusion has, uh, has, has bought you all those sandwiches and soon will buy you beer. We thank you, Fusion, for that and, and is sponsoring the event. Uh, the Tao and the Knight Foundations uh, underwrite all the activities of the so named Tao Knight uh, Center here at, at CUNY and we're grateful to them. Uh, Hal Strauss uh, did a great job uh, organizing all this and getting everybody together and I'm always very grateful to Hal and my CUNY colleagues for doing all their work. So with that, Hal, where are we on time? Are we good? Hal. You didn't, even, you didn't even hear me thank him. Uh, okay, so I think next we have Jason. So Jason, come on up. So you've been at uh, Vice News for how long now? Well, I've been working with Vice since 2007, mm -hmm. as, starting as a freelancer and then coming on full time in 2011. And Vice News as a standalone platform just launched in March of this year, so about six months. So f just to get our bearings straight here, define Vice News versus Vice first. Well, sure. I mean, I started um, as a producer doing long form documentary content around the world. Um, that led into the HBO show. Uh, I was a producer on that show. And then when we started having discussions about creating a standalone platform for our news content, I put my hand up and said I wanted to uh, take charge of that. And, um, and then, you know, uh, then I found out how difficult that was. Still start on a high level. What makes Vice Vice? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think it is and what does the outside world think it is? Or another way to ask the question is, when you hire someone, mm -hmm. what do you tell them it is? What do you expect to hear from them about what they want to do that matches what you do? It's a tricky question because I think it is so much, it's so based on instinct and gut that I think even within the company, we would be challenged, we'd have a hard time defining it. It's, it Really? <clears throat> well, sure. In that, no, because everyone thinks they know what, what it is. So when people, so people say they've been big fans, they've been watching this stuff, they love Vice, they know Vice like the back of their hand, and we're like, great. And then they pitch us some stories, and we're like, those are terrible stories. Okay, and give me an example. What's not a Vice story? <laughs> what is a Vice story? <laughs> I should have answers to these questions. <laughs> I should have warned you. Yeah, I know. God. I've, um, I've, I've been terrified of this for weeks now. No, <laughs> we're nice here. Um, inside ISIS is obviously a vice story. Inside the back, the, 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 the you know, Ukrainian uh, uh, front line of, of, of revolution, those were vice stories. Sure, I mean, I guess in terms of what is a vice story, I mean, stories that other people probably wouldn't cover. I mean, so yeah, there are stories that people have pitched <laughs> that are interesting news stories that um, would be interesting to pursue and, and maybe you know uh, actually provide a, a public good. Um, but then you have to ask, well, why would we do that when there are other people who do that? So I guess there is a bit of story selection, kind of knowing that we have an opportunity to do things that other people don't. So I think there are probably a lot of talented people in organizations where they are kind of frustrated that they don't get to do a certain kind of story. So yeah, I think we certainly consciously do things that we have opportunities. I'm still gonna bug you to hear though, but yeah, yeah. that kind of story, put some flesh on that. What, what, what's a vice kind of story? Well, I mean. Or, or maybe another. Sure, I'll, I'll, give, you, okay, I'll sure. give an example of you know, one of my favorite stories that I produced, which was um, bride kidnapping in Kyrgyzstan, um, which again, uh, speaking of TV news, you know, at least in the US, there's not a lot of love for foreign reporting, foreign news. Um, so bride kidnapping in Kyrgyzstan, spent sending a crew there for two weeks to try and investigate this practice and, and uh, capture it in a documentary style uh, is probably not something that they would do, that something that we would do, have done, um, and came away with a pretty powerful film about it. So. So there's story selection. What about, I think the most important thing about Vice is the voice of Vice. Right? Well, tell me what it is and I'll tell you if you're wrong. Wow. <clears throat> um, 
I'll be politically incorrect, it's ballsy, <laughs> it's personal to an extent, it, it takes you there. Um, uh, it tries to be direct and blunt. How am I wrong? No, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think some of the things that we talk about amongst ourselves is trying to call things as you see it, and that doesn't mean just injecting opinion about everything or opinion about things that you don't know. It's basically an emphasis on going to a place and reporting on what you are seeing because you are there and someone else is not. And, and that may not fit into a grand narrative about a particular place or a particular situation, but it, it can be true of that particular moment in time. Um, and I think an important thing that kind of also jumps off of your point about stand-ups, I mean, you're talking about more of the classic local news live shot, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but I always felt, I, I think the big difference before I worked at Vice, some of their earliest video content, it was the first time that I kind of put myself in the, in the shoes of that reporter. It was the first time I thought about them and about where they were and what that situation was like and what they were doing rather than, you know, a trained professional showing up on screen kind of downloading what they had learned that day. You know, in a, just a minute 30, here's what happened and here's what several elites had to say about it and back to you, John. Um, yeah. So that was something that really connected with me and made me want to be part, part of it. Um, and that's something we strive to do, I think, to give people not just a news service, not just information, but to try and convey a sense of place and of the situation and, and of people. And I think that's another thing that's really important is just to, to consider it a very human <laughs> approach to journalism is just really focused on people and their stories and giving them enough room to tell their stories. Nick Denton used to say at Gawker that he didn't want to hire journalists because he had to, they had to unlearn too much. Do you hire TV people? Um, the right TV people who want to get out of it for the right reasons. Okay, so tell me more, what does that mean? <laughs> well, <clears throat> what do you hear from them that makes it seem like it's the right reason? Well, I mean, it, it has to be someone who's self-aware to know the things that television news is doing wrong or kind of the artificial constraints that have been placed on them as journalists due to maybe too much bureaucracy or too much of uh, that's the way it has always been done, therefore that is how you're supposed to do it. So not a lot of, so you know, people who are, feel stifled by the format, by the vernacular, by the visual vernacular, by the storytelling style, by the, well, you need to have a character who speaks good English and, uh, and can speak very concisely and with great passion um, versus someone who speaks Arabic and is a little bit long-winded and maybe full of shit here and there, but but interest, but but to allow that to play out to where you can actually kind of judge. It also helps you judge them instead of, you know, like the succinct soundbite that's exactly the point you wanted them to make. I mean, you know, sometimes we'll let people undercut their own arguments, and you know, and it's interesting to watch. And I mean, I think you can learn more from that, and also understand people's motivations in sitting down and speaking to a journalist. So. I, I saw your boss, Shane Smith, talk at a hoity-toity business conference, Foursquare, and um, uh, I, one thing that he said was that it's about getting more voices in from the world. Mm -hmm. Is that part, I mean, as opposed to the president of CNN saying there's nobody to interview, you're saying that, that there's everybody to interview. Sure, I mean, I think, yes, there's, there's no shortage of stories uh, around the world. The world is a fascinating place, and I think maybe that's something that it, it sounds like a, a no-brainer. Like, I mean, I think every journalist likes to tell the story about how they read the paper as a kid or their parents read the paper and it was an important part of their life. But frankly, it wasn't an important part of my life for a long time. I mean, I remember I was working in a, a coffee shop in 97 and you know, one of the customers is talking about Monica Lewinsky and how this is gonna affect the presidency. And I was like, he was trying to explain it to me and I didn't get it and I didn't really much care because um, it really wasn't going to impact my life. And um, I think it was really only after 9-11 that I started to understand that, oh, even if I'm not paying attention to the outside world, it can have an effect on my life. And that was kind of the beginning of a change of attitude for me in terms of paying attention to international affairs. And 
wanting to play some part in trying to understand what the hell is going on and conveying it to basically an earlier version of myself, the person who didn't care much. Or right, so talk about that. Yeah. Is, is Vice aimed at young people squarely? No, I don't think so. I think it's just that that approach, I think, resonates with young people. I mean, you know. What about it you think resonates? Well, I th I, and, and again, I'm just considering we're all talking about TV news here. I think you know, you've know, you grown up with TV news as a, a thing that's there. It's, it's kind of like a, a utility, like water or electricity, and you turn on the TV and you, know, you might get a newscast and there's a person just kind of speaking information at you, whether you're paying attention or not, you're kind of making breakfast and you pick up a, a couple things that you actually care about, the things that you don't care about, you kind of go back to daydreaming. And, um, and so again, I think there's, it comes down to engagement in terms of, does TV news do something that you actually want to engage with or is it just kind of, they're providing a little, a daily service for you which you can pay attention to or choose not to pay attention to versus um, trying to bring people into the story and try and give it a beginning, middle, and end and something that they can follow. You know, I think context is very important in that. And that's one of the benefits that we have in terms of documentary style um, storytelling is that, you know, maybe one of the reasons that television news has a hard time doing international news is because uh, when you say today in Iran, um, if you don't know what happened yesterday in Iran, you don't think that there's any reason to pay attention to the story. So, um, and that's, you know, working on, for example, the uh, Vice show on HBO, that's a benefit that we've always had is that we tell a story from beginning, middle, and end, um, and give people enough information to understand this story which they're about to tell, and people will find that they are interested in things that they didn't think they were. So. Right, so Vice, Old Vice, Big Vice, Mama Vice, Papa Vice, and the HBO show were about making these kinds of stories. Along comes Vice News. Is Vice News a destination to keep me informed? Yeah, well, that's the thing. We're trying to bridge that gap yeah. because I think the, with the launch of Vice News, it gives us the chance to kind of play to our strengths, continue doing what we're arguably good at. Um, is that longer form feature documentary storytelling and also applying that to you know, the written word, trying to do a lot of editorial features, um, but also ramping that up in terms of volume, kind of doing about 10 times as much video as we did beforehand, um, video news. Um, also getting to diversify the subjects so we don't always have to be going for the big uh, mind-blowing international documentary. We can excuse me, spend a little more time covering domestic issues, covering smaller, quieter, but really interesting and really important environmental issues, um, such as pet coke in Chicago or you know, bomb trains and things like that. Um, but yeah, but we are trying to find our place in keeping you informed, because what is a news site if you don't go, if when you go to it every day, you want to get some sense of what's happening in the world, not just a list of things that we found interesting. Sarah Bartlett told you that, that her son watches Vice stuff and uh, any some year old uh, uh, advisor of ours watches Vice. So it is not just for young people. Yeah. So let's imagine that um, uh, Deborah Turness at NBC comes to you tomorrow with a huge bucket load of money and says, come produce the evening news with Brian Williams. Having learned everything you've learned, mm -hmm. what do you do with it? Well, here's your chance. Well, now it's here. <clears throat> Well, I guess you ask, uh, are the constraints, aside from that bucket load of cash, still the same? I mean, are we trying to make a newscast that is supposed to get an incredible amount of ratings and, and generally, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of the things that we see as, or that we're talking about as problems with TV news are reverse engineered to what it's supposed to be achieving, which is a massive audience. Uh, so, of course, you go for the lowest common denominator. And, um, so that's the first problem, and um, yeah, I guess I guess that's the and, well, then, and, and, and also getting you know I guess you'd ask for the chance to go back and ask why we do everything every component of it. Uh -huh. Why is the desk like this? Why is uh, why are why are we spending so much time looking at semen on hotel uh, comforters under a blacklight? I mean, like uh, things like that. You know, like 
and again, it, like you look at those, also the newscasts, and they automatically reveal who their advertisers are, right? I mean, so a lot of stories about Medicare. Okay, I guess your audience is in the 60s. Don't and, make fun uh, of us. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I guess it comes down to what is it you want to achieve? Not what do you, what do you want to achieve, but what are those constraints? Or what should you be, isn't TV ruled a lot by the fear of if we change this, we can screw up. If, we, if you upset the boat, then it's gonna, you're gonna you don't rock it, man. It, it's worked for years, right? And so that's the, the orthodoxy of television is we've always done it this way, so we keep doing it that way, and the first person who breaks out and doesn't do it that way, uh-oh, mm -hmm. all right? So maybe NBC's the wrong one to pick on. Maybe you go to the, you know, the lowest rated, but, but, but if you, I mean, I, I still want to push you a little harder. If you really had the chance to, if somebody said, you know, screw it, the business model is going, going to hell in a handbasket. We're number three anyway. Fuck it. Do whatever you want. What's that? Well, What's it look like a month later? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd increase international coverage, first of okay. all, just all right, I mean, one. as a way of standing out, if okay. I were. Um, but yeah, I think I'd s spend more time on those stories. And also, another thing, I guess, would be to increase the level at which it's written. If you look back to, um, I'd say you are old enough to remember In the News, which was <laughs> on Saturday mornings, uh, in, in between Saturday morning cartoons. And it was, you know, um, here's in a minute 30 explaining the Arab-Israeli conflict. And it was written to a higher level than most broadcast television is today. Um, it was shocking. And it's something that I think about whenever people actively decide that they're going to make news for young people. And that always seems to be a folly because it tends to come off like older people making television for um, young people who are basically, they're making TV for how innocent they think their own children are. Like, you know, <laughs> okay, all right, like they don't realize good. that they're actually in the world experiencing real shit <laughs> and, and having sex and doing drugs and um, actually talking about important international issues. And so, you know, when someone comes off and does some sort of like cutesy little, I'm gonna explain the world to you sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But look, I'm a young face, so therefore you relate to me. That doesn't actually play. Is, um, Travis, I don't even have a schedule. What, what, what time does this go to? Uh, <laughs> okay, because I want to leave some, you're 110. Okay, so I want to get, uh, one last question, then I'm going to get okay, over the room. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to get Amy on so she makes her train. Uh, you alluded earlier to the business model, which I think is critical to this. As long as we are in a mass media business model, reach and frequency becomes unique users and page views, then yes, we're gonna do anything to get anybody because they're all equally valuable and we're gonna shove them all, all their eyeballs in front of advertisers and hope the advertisers don't realize how ineffective that is and cash the checks, <laughs> right? <laughs> Ironically, Vice is still dependent to some extent on the old business model. Mm. I mean, here you want, you want a TV channel? Why? Well, You've got the freaking internet. Why would you? Why would? Why would you, there be this, this dance? Have been with this dance with the likes of Time Warner? I think you've got off with your lives by staying away from that. Why would you even dance with the old parts? I know you're not on the business side, but just remember, it's among friends. Here. Sure. Well, if, if you, I mean, if you just want to talk hypothetically about Fine. business models and Thank television, you. and, and uh, I guess why do people rob banks? Because <laughs> that's where the money's at, right? So. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's certainly plenty of there's there's still TV money there. still alive in terms of okay. business, but I mean, so but, but you know that's that's what that's what I think led Al Gore astray because he was going to come along with current and he was going to change it all and everybody was going to the audience was going to be the inventor of TV and they were going to change it all, but then he ended up with MSOs and then he couldn't put anything on the internet because the MSOs wouldn't let him and he was stuck in the old business model. I just fear for you if you get stuck. In the, in the in the grips of the Comcast of the world, uh -huh. you're screwed. Well, I mean, I'd say that our benefit is that we are coming from the other direction. I mean, okay. we're we're we always we pride ourselves on being platform agnostic, and that's not to say that we're not conscious of formats that play to you know the particular platform. So you know whether it's YouTube or television, so on and so forth. Um, some of those constraints can be really useful and create interesting products. And so, I mean, for example, we're platform agnostic, we'll do incredible 
you know, very expensive international documentaries and put them on YouTube, but we'll also do that for HBO, but also conscious that HBO has a, a certain audience and, and, you know, it exists in a certain place. And, and look, as a producer on that show, I was never more terrified because I was, we were just doing what we were doing. And then I think the first moment I realized that I had to think about it a little bit differently was when I went to visit my sister in the suburbs of Chicago and we were at her house and she has some, you know, 12,000 inch HD TV and, and, uh, and I don't. Um, and, uh, and I saw the kids in a couch and I was like, oh, this is where this thing that I'm making is going to play. You know, not all the kids I know, you know, why? so, and, and, and kind of keeping her family in mind as the audience for this, just realized I had to, we had to change it a little bit. Um, so the same, I guess the same is true for anything we may do going forward in television. It's, it's trying to find what is the way to continue doing what we want to do, but keeps in mind, I guess it goes back to the constraints, which, yeah. which yeah. may be what are the goals. I mean, so to make an incredible... Uh, Don't lose your voice. Well, yeah. Don't well, lose your voice. That's all good. All right, all right. Questions, arguments, anything. Barbara, coming right to you. You're going to. No, because we're streaming, so. Oh, we're streaming? Uh, I have to start. start I'm, I'm starting with a silent scream. <laughs> okay. Because uh, I'm sitting here, first of all, on the list of things that TV news uh, does well, I didn't see anything with, if I were being charitable, I might say the demonstrate one would fill the bill. But there was nothing that said, pictures, show you stuff. Show me stuff I can't get into, but the camera can. And that's critical. And so connected to that is we have just listened to 20 minutes of a conversation, and I've never seen Vice. Could we see it? Yes. I, we've been talking about something that you haven't shown us. And I just want to say that like, I think that's an incredibly important Purdue, part of uh, what TV does. So could we see it? Yes, I, I definitely would have pre -record, preferred pre-recording all of my answers. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know all maybe the next time we uh, can do that. Alistair's looking right now to pull something up. Saul, uh, it, after this, watch the entire Inside ISIS, uh, 40 minutes. Yeah, it's, it's a TV to, show it's, it's and it's on, online. It's online. You? If you just go to vice, vicenews.com for the... talked about when um, Jeff asked the question about what would happen if you took over the nightly news about constraints. I'm interested in what the constraints are in your business. I mean, do you have to think about, will I get enough viewers on my um, documentary about what's going on in Chechnya or wherever to pay for the crew for two weeks? Or are you living in some sort of bubble where you get all this money from Fox and you don't actually have to follow economic rules. You know, is there a, a stable economic model that will support what you're doing? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> well, uh, I, I'll, I'll answer your question and I'll dodge part of your question. In, <laughs> in saying that, I mean, fortunately, I am not on the business side of things, so there are highly trained professionals who do that. I, I just work, at, work on the content and editorial side. Um, that said, of course, those people are on my back to make sure that we are, you know, performing. Um, and to that end, so yeah, s stories, yeah, of course we're conscious of viewership and, and, um, and success. Uh, but the, I think the main tool in selecting stories for us is just our own interest in them. Whether we think they are interesting important um, and worth doing. It's kind of like following Goethe's rules of, you know, like what, what was the artist trying to achieve? Did they achieve it? And was it worth doing? And um, uh, so, yeah, it's kind of, I think it, it may sound insane, especially if you work in a, maybe a more bureaucratic organization, but it really is just kind of us talking to each other and deciding amongst ourselves that that is indeed damn interesting and worth pursuing. And, and to date, it has turned out that that's what our audience has also thought. You know, so it's kind of um, do what you believe in and 
it's a gamble to see if hopefully everyone else agrees it's interesting. And Let somebody so else far. do the rest. Yeah. We have one back here. Hey, um, you guys have obviously been growing really quickly in terms of both audience, but also I would imagine in staff. So uh, just out of curiosity, how many people are you working with right now? And what's your relationship to working with freelancers? And would you like to do some vice pieces? Yeah. That's why you're asking. <laughs> say so, say so, it's okay. Sure. How do I get, how do you hire me? There you go. <laughs> we hire everyone. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the staff, it's I think right now technically working specifically on Vice News is around 60. Um, are we under, is there a fire? Um, uh, but that said, there, it, it's a pretty, it's a, there's a lot of cross-pollination between teams, between the HBO team will work on news stuff and we'll work on HBO stuff. Um, and basically anyone has a good story from anywhere in the company certainly has the opportunity to pitch it wherever it's most appropriate. Um, so yeah, so it's 60, but also a cast of thousands. Um, and our relationship to freelancers. Uh, freelancers can play an important part, they, they, they do play an important part in what we do, um, but it is never using freelancers because they're cheaper or because something's dangerous. It's because they have a unique skill set or an expertise in a certain area, or you know they're just people who actively. The reason that they're able to find the stories they do is because they're you know uh, globe-trotting, thrill-seeking, uh, good. Well, time get out there and get stories, and then you sell the stories to him. All right, I think we have time for one more, so let's grab this one. Can you talk about uh, the Inside ISIS piece you did? What are the vagaries with it? Because for some looking at it, I've covered Iraq on and off for print and TV for 20 plus years. So one could see that perhaps you were played by them, you played them, but what do you think is the sort of critical look at that piece? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, you know, the. Uh, the ability to do that film came through the guy who made it, a guy named Median Darye, who's um, worked in the region for about 15 years. He's Iraqi, um, and he's covered every kind of conflict in that region. And you know, this is one of those things where we just kind of went to him and said, "Is this something that is possible?" And he said, "Let me check." And then he came back and said, "I've asked," and the answer is yes. And so he kind of went and did it. Um, you know, in, in Obviously, as we've seen in everything that the Islamic State, the group known as the Islamic State, um, have released, they're pretty media savvy. They know what they're doing. Um, they're no dummies. So, you know, they they were obviously familiar with our work and, and familiar with a style that allows people to say their piece and allows you know the audience to decide. Um, and so obviously they rolled the dice and decided to let us, give us that access. And uh, I'm curious what they think about it. <laughs> because, because it's, you know, like it's interesting. I was doing an event last night and someone was like kind of accusing us of feeding into their propaganda. But I was like, yeah, but uh, that Fox News was playing clips from it on repeat, basically using it as an excuse to bomb the shit out of them. So it's like, you know, eye of the beholder, I suppose. But. My last question is on that. Um, I worked at the San Francisco Examiner when the Jonestown story happened. If you're probably too young to know the Jonestown story, but we lost, I lost colleagues there. And I remember the editor, taking the editor to get his passport to go to Guyana, because he'd been the man responsible for sending the staff down there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of our staff died. The weight of that responsibility mm -hmm. is tremendous. Vice, when I watch things, even, even from inside the barricades in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, pardon me, on, on Vice, there's danger there. Because, that, because it really it, it does an amazing job of taking me there, but it's taking me to a dangerous place. How do you deal with that? Uh, uh, are there things that are too dangerous? Um, knowing what you know now about the beheadings, would you still have done the Inside ISIS story? How do you deal with the danger part? Yeah, I mean, yes, there certainly are places that are too dangerous, and it's you know it's kind of situation by situation, and depends on where we are at in that timeline. Um, it's a very good question about the beheadings, and I would, I'd probably say not. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, wouldn't have been a risk <laughs> based on that yeah, information. Yeah. What you know that you know, um, but yeah, I mean, you talk about the Ukraine stuff, and Simon Ostrovsky is our reporter there. Um, you know, he's Great an incredibly <laughs> brave uh, guy, and. Uh, but he got abducted in April, and that was the first time that 
we had to deal with that sort of thing, and that became a very real situation, you know, on of trying to figure out what the hell's going on because, you know, in there's a lot of kidnap and ransom all around the world, and, and it happens in a place like Nigeria, and it's kind of almost like an industry and and uh, a situation where it's like, oh, well, it's just you need to get these guys some money, and then you get this person back. But this was a unique situation where we're dealing with a kind of uh, self-declared mayor of a town who's uh, slightly drunk and definitely crazy, and we have no idea what he wants, and the situation around him is crumbling, you know? And so I, I would say there's never been anything more stressful than trying to ha manage that situation. And um, so, yeah, I would, so this is all to say we're incredibly sensitive to it, and so we're not cowboys, and um, we're, not afraid to go to places that are in fact dangerous to cover stories that we think are important enough to take some risk, but we try to mitigate that risk as much as possible. And you even so. got the affection of David Carr, so congratulations <laughs> on that, he's a hard one to decide. So thank you, Jason, thank you very much. Everyone, let's thank Jason. And, thank you. and uh, oh, thank you. Uh, Amy, over to you. So the Pew Center for, which, are you with the Center for Internet in American Life? No, you're at the Pew. You Journalism went, Project. Journalism Project, okay. Pew is invaluable to us all for the data it presents and the hard facts it gives us. And so Amy was very generous to come and tell us what they know now about the state of TV news and its audiences. So Amy, over to you. I do have slides, but I'm going to try not to read them. <laughs> And the good news is I'm not talking about the state of the newspaper industry, right? <laughs> um, but seriously, it's not, it's not all bad. I think um, hopefully what I will impart a little bit through some of this data is that the time is very much ripe for TV news innovation, for digital video news innovation, whether TV or web-based or phone-based, whatever the platform may be. Uh, Americans like to watch news. They have liked to watch news for a long time. They still like to watch news. There are a lot of places, though, where that viewership is declining and where the formats have gotten stuck, if you will, uh, in what they've known, and other places where we're starting to see growth and rise. And so I wanted to share some of that data with you. Uh, as you all, I think, are um, burgeoning uh, into new areas of uh, video news storytelling. So you can see here, um, Again, Americans like to watch TV news. Uh, it has been the number one way people get news for years and years and years. It remains the number one as a whole, as a platform when you look at that, but it is declining, and it's declining pretty rapidly. What's rising is web-based news, uh, whether on your phone or on your desktop or anything else. So as you see those two sort of converging, one of the questions that comes to mind, at least in my mind, would be how does somebody take advantage of that, of where you're seeing this strong interest in television news, in, in, in news watching, um, but some kind of, of dissatisfaction or lack of interest or lessening of interest in the way it's being uh, watched now increases in a new form. So what do we make of that? Um, part of that decline, much of that decline, has been among young people. So if you look at these data, you can see that from 2006 to 2012, uh, the uh, percent of 18 to 29 year olds that are uh, watching local TV news, uh, I'm sorry, this is any TV news, um, has declined uh, by 15%. At the local level, it's just about the same uh, in terms of the decline that we're seeing. Uh, six, uh, uh, in local TV news, uh, the numbers fell from 42% in 2006 to just 28% of those under 30 in 2012. So a real moving away from local television news when, you, when it comes to young people. Yet, it still continues to be the number one named source, named, no, named place that people turn to for news when they ask them how they get different kinds of news. Again and again and again. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, and here you can see the local television news number, uh, where it's a 14% uh, loss among those that are 18 to 29 year olds uh, from 2006 to 2012. 
The topic mix at the same time, uh, our data have found, we've done a number of different kinds of research on local television news as well as cable and network and others, uh, uh, has become uh, more and more formulaic. Uh, we did a content study uh, a little while back which found this growing increase in traffic weather and actually a new area of sports where the sports coverage uh, between 2006 and 2012 um, actually almost doubled uh, in, in local news. But together, those three accounting for about 40% of the coverage overall. And in a study that we did of, of uh, data towards the end of 2012, we found that in a mix of 48 different newscasts that, that we watched the local level, almost half of them, 20, led with a weather story. So the preponderance there of focus on sports, traffic, weather. When we did a local, t uh, local news survey a few years back, and we asked people um, about different outlets they go to for different kinds of news, local TV was again on top, but what people named it for, uh, what, what they ranked it first for <coughs> was again weather uh, and breaking news and then also traffic at tied with, uh, with radio uh, for traffic news. Uh, so a very limited amount of information that people really think of when they think of local news and actually uh, news topics that are in many ways replaceable by whatever most convenient app you now have on your phone. Sports, you can get update a million different ways. Traffic, weather, you can go to a million different places to get that kind of information. So a question there of how local television news can sustain uh, the interest as these the younger generations continue to age uh, and new generations come in. At the same time, there is a whole lot of financial interest in local television news. Uh, we did a study that came out in this year's uh, State of the Media report, and the number of uh, full power local television stations that changed hands in 2013 was up 205%. There were over uh, almost 300 uh, local TV stations that changed hands. The dollar value was up 367% year over year. Uh, for a total of eight point, almost $9 billion. And that uh, suggests a couple of things. One is the interest in that there is really this lucrative nature of local television news from the political advertising, but also from the uh, licensing fees, the retransmission fees that places can charge. And as owners, the more that you own, the more that you can, um, the more bargaining power you have when you come to the table uh, for this kind of stuff. But it's also meant that in some areas, you might have a station or two that's getting new news, but there's also been a growing consolidation of television news, where we now have a quarter of local TV news stations that are not producing their own news. They're carrying news that's produced by another station. Cable news, again, uh, we had seen a lot of rise in the coming years, but the last few years have been quite difficult uh, for the cable news industry, and we're starting to see signs, uh, evidence of a kind of ceiling for the audience that's interested in cable news. And you can see here uh, that, that this line chart over time uh, we're in 2013 by year end, prime time overall was down 11%. And there was actually declines across all three, even Fox News saw, saw a slight decline in prime time news. We then just looked at data from August of 2013 uh, to August of this year, and CNN alone was down 25, almost 25% in prime time. So a real decline there in terms of viewership. And the average age of that audience is continuing to grow as well. Uh, when you look at cable news. Uh, and again, some of the content reports we've done have found a shift even in the kind of coverage that these cable stations are offering to not only a growing emphasis on the politics that we've seen over the last several years, but a growing evidence and use of opinion and commentary in the place of sort of edited produced packages. If we think about the things that Vice is doing, uh, we're talking about it a minute ago. So you can see here, if you look at cable morning, midday, and evening, um, across the way, there's a greater emphasis here on commentary and opinion than actual factual reporting uh, that we see. And even CNN, which had stood out for many years for the level of edited reporting that it was doing, has actually cut the number of edited, the amount of time it's devoted to edited packages nearly in half between 2007 and 2012. And this is data that we've had as a part of a index where this is across every day over those years. We're collecting primetime data, so it's a whole lot of television uh, uh, newscasts that we're watching here. So the reporting's getting more centered on commentary, more around politics, uh, less in-depth packaging, let alone innovative ways of storytelling. 
At the same time, we're starting to see a rise in the digital news viewership numbers. If you look here, and this is data that's from um, uh, 2013, and you have about 63% of Americans, of, of the, and this is over 18, so we're not getting the young, young people. <clears throat> it's very hard to survey uh, people that are under 18. Um, so this is those are over 18, but you have 63% that are watching some kind of online video, and about half of those that are watching online news video. And this is about comparable to what, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, that, in other words, it sort of gives the feeling that the people are turning away from news being produced by mainstream organizations, but they may just be consuming, consuming on a different platform. Yeah, so the, the question was, do I know what percentage of news uh, people are watching online that's coming from legacy uh, or mainstream news as opposed to sort of an online-only entity? I don't have that, that number here. What I can say is that when we look at, say, links that are shared in social media, uh, or links that are shared in other ways, the vast majority are still coming from mainstream, from legacy. Uh, there's, there are more and more opportunities for video that is also actually um, citizen posted, uh, consumer created and posted. And when we did a study of um, YouTube news, now it seems like ages ago, it was in the very early ages, it was um, 2011, uh, and we had looked at two years worth of top news stories on YouTube Every week, uh, we were collecting it and studying it. And what we found was actually really fascinating. It was a very wide mix of content. Some of it was straight from a, a news broadcast that you know, was shared. Some of it was a pure citizen piece that was uploaded, raw, <laughs> unedited, that was shared. Some of it was citizen content that was edited by a news organization and then on the site. Some of it was stuff that came from a news organization originally that a citizen that did something with and posted on their own YouTube page. So a very wide mix of the kind of content that people are sharing, as well as um, the length of stories, uh, which we'll get up in a minute. Uh, but uh, one of the other points I was going to make is that this is a very similar percentage to what we've seen in the role that social media has, or the place that news has. I should say, in social media. So on Facebook, on Twitter, when we look at the percent of um, those 18 and older that are using these social media sites, again, about half of them are saying they're getting news there. So it's pretty consistent with how we're seeing other um, uh, news becoming a part of other new developing areas on the web. Hi, I'm tweeting here. And uh, news ranks pretty high, you can see here, in the mix of what people are doing. So it's about half that are getting news. And when you look at all the different kinds of news, uh, uh, different kinds of videos they might be watching, news ranks in the middle. So it suggests to us a real opportunity here. And particularly if you also look at the demographics, a draw among the young people, among the younger generations. And this was something, again, that we saw on social media where there actually were greater portions of 18 to 29 year old social users that were getting news uh, on Facebook and on Twitter than older generations. And here, too, we see a gr greater percentage of those that are um, un you know, certainly under 50, and a strong showing among those that are 18 to 29 that are actually getting, uh, watching news videos uh, in addition to any other viewing that they may do. Can I have one quick second? I should have said this uh -huh. before. We're going to make the slides available offline. I know it's small, and I apologize for that. We need a bigger screen, but they'll all be available online afterwards. So keep going. Great. And if anybody has questions, they're, they are welcome to get my email from Jeff or Hal and follow up. Be happy to do that. Uh, but I want a thing to note is that growth has slowed a little bit. So as we look at this data over time, you can actually see that from 2007 to 2009, we had seen a real strong growth. That first bar is in um, is overall online watching, and then the uh, lighter bar is the um, news is uh, uh, online news video watching. And you can see that there was quite an increase just in two years' time from 26% to 33%, um, which would have been an overall um, uh, uh, increase that was much larger than what we saw over the five-year period that followed from 2009 to 2013. Uh, so there is a question here about what is the sustainability of interest and the ultimate level of online news watching uh, that people might do. So we sliced it a little bit deeper 
and we looked at people that had smartphones in this survey and people that didn't have smartphones. And you can see here that it's a much stronger showing among people with smartphones. So a suggestion that this continued rise in mobile uh, consumption and mobile habits among Americans and, and people in general uh, uh, may provide uh, another increase and in sort of another uh, level of usage uh, when it comes to online digital viewing. And, and uh, finally, one of the other points I wanted to make, again, as I mentioned, was that, that one of the other things we're seeing that really suggests also an opportunity for trying things is this great variation in form and in length. And I mentioned the YouTube study already, and then when we looked at the top news videos on Vox uh, for 2013, the length of those ranged from three and a half minutes to over 30 minutes. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for different ways of putting together video that can be uh, interesting and draw um, large audiences uh, in addition to um, uh, uh, others that, you know, that may not. At the same time, there was a Tau Center study where they looked at user-generated content and across all of what they looked at, just one had really gone viral. So it's not easy. It's not easy to get that really large audience. Um, but there's an opportunity for a wide range of things to actually get noticed. So I want to talk a little bit about revenue. I know there are a couple questions, um, and I'll just share a little bit of, of, um, of the data that we have here, uh, which is that it's a challenging place. As we've seen with online um, dollars overall, um, video, there has been a lot of emphasis in, in, in 2012 and in 2013, and this growth and this push, and everybody was trying to figure out how to have you know, uh, ads overlaid into their videos and the pre-roll the pre and the, in the middle roll and the after roll and, you know, trying to sort of think of this as a real opportunity uh, to find a revenue fix in the digital space. Well, it's certainly grown. Um, and this is, I should say, these dollars are actually um, all online video ad dollars. It's not just news because they don't separate it out now. News is still too little. Um, but if you look at overall, it's grown about 42 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 45 percent year over year, so almost doubled. Um, but still, it's that tiny little light pink bar at the bottom. So even though it's had this very, very significant amount of growth, it's actually still accounting for only 10 percent of U.S. digital ad revenue overall, which is that tall bar. And if you pull that out to all ad revenue, not just in the digital space, the um, video ad revenue counts for 2%. So it's still very small in terms of the total dollars that it's growing, uh, that, it's, that it's bringing in. And many big players have already moved in. And this is something that is a real note of caution for people that are moving into this space because we saw something very, very similar happen in the online space overall in display advertising. You now have five companies that account for over half of all of the online display ad spending, so all the display ad spending online. Uh, and all the rest of that 50% is left for everybody else. So the opportunity there for news organizations to get some of that money is getting smaller and smaller, and it happened very quickly. And, and Facebook was actually very late into that game, but then very quickly, over about a year and a half time, rose to the top in terms of, of um, uh, pulling in the uh, largest amount of, of actually ad dollar and superseded Google uh, finally in that space. So here, YouTube, uh, owned by Google, already has a stronghold on the market. And uh, if you look at the 2013 dollars, the estimates from eMarketer, uh, and I just checked today and they don't have a final number in yet, but the estimates for 2013 were um, $850 million in video advertising alone which would be 20, about 20% of the market. So that's just YouTube alone in terms of what they're doing. And Facebook, again, is only barely in this video space. It just tested its first attempted video in December of 2013. Uh, and so again, if we think about how quickly it was able to come into the display ad market and really be able to command a lot of that space, um, it's certainly important to watch what's happening in the, in the video uh, space as well in terms of ad dollars. And so I just end by, you know, hopefully if you look over this again, coming back to this idea that watching news has been an important part of Americans' lives for decades. It still is. The network evening news still attracts some 20 million viewers a night, uh, which is huge. 
Um, but there are some real challenges that those um, formats are facing in terms of audience, in terms of the age and the decline that's happening. Uh, and so there is an opportunity to think about what the digital space allows in terms of some of the things that even Jeff put up um, in his slide at the beginning of the session here, in terms of the, the things that video storytelling can do and the opportunities, especially with digital and mobile, uh, to be able to convey these kinds of stories to people in new ways. I would end there. Amy, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We have seven minutes, literally, uh, before Amy has to leave. So, questions for Amy. Lightning round of questions for Amy. Hi, is there any way to know how many people go online to get a live stream of a cable network for breaking news? Is there any way you break that out? Um, you know, that's a good question, and we, um, I don't have a number I can give you on it. Um, we did look, and they all, all the cables offer some live streaming now, and we actually looked at local television, 30 different local markets um, in the past year, and found that about half of those had live streaming, but on their YouTube channels, some of them had no followers. Some had a couple hundred. So it, you know, it's 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 hard to know. Um, um, but a lot, or at least they are offering it. But yeah. Amy Saul Hansel from CTV, and uh, I just want to thank you real fast for all the data sets. I've used it enormously in my startup. Uh, they're great, and the fact you publish them. One thing I've been trying to see in your data, and I'm not sure you ask, but maybe you have intuition or have seen other data about, is why? What is it th that is turning people off fr from TV news? Are they, in particular, liking to read more than watch? And what are, you know, what are, the, what is drawing people to the online choices they're making? What kind of qualitative data do we have at all or clues to what people want, what they don't like, and so on. I mean, I would say, um, you know, based on some of the data that we've gathered, again, I mean, with all the decline, local TV news still continues to come up here as what people name, you know, across the country, it appears as, as one of the, as, as the highest, if not one of the highest, uh, and others as well. So if I just hit something, I'm sorry. I think I put my elbow down on the keyboard. Um, so, um, that said, when you think about a lot of the audiences that are not going there, the young people, the way young people are functioning today is digitally. Those online numbers are so concentrated among young people and, and the, their interest in um, getting content that is interesting, tells them something they're not expecting, shareable, something they can talk about that they can share, that they can pass on. You know, that, that sort of new element of what we talk about more and more is the flow of information, that it's the flow of news now. So, you know, the level of sharing and sending and commenting and wanting to engage in some way, which is partly why the sort of user content is interesting. And one of the things that we, we did see when we looked at some, um, we were actually just doing some internal work looking at different um, Facebook pages. And local television stations were actually fairly popular um, on Facebook in certain communities. And part of that was because people were posting pictures of how their yard looked in today's weather and how you know, they could engage and connect uh, in a way that you can't do by sitting and looking at a screen. Um, but if you think about the way young people function, part of the data I, that, that we've collected to me suggests that there are actually a lot of opportunities and a lot of engagement among younger people with news today in a way that didn't happen. Um, because they're in this digital space, and news kind of gets mixed in with everything else they do. So if you think about news content in the digital space, it, it might not be sitting down and saying, I'm gonna take 30 minutes to digest whatever this outlet has to tell me, but it's, oh, somebody shared an interesting story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch that or read it and share that, and then the next thing I do might be about, who knows, you know, golf or, dare I say, cats, or you know, something like that, that's totally unrelated to news. But it gets mixed into the flow of their day in a way that's very different than the structured television format that um, uh, uh, we've all been used to for decades. Amy, related to that, I have a theory about mobile. I think we in media are still forcing people to go to a portal and dare them to find what they want in this huge thing versus Google and Facebook create multiple applications, and by your choice of those applications, you declare your context of use right now. 
are you seeing anything about the usage, especially among young people, but about mobile, that mobile, isn't, mobile as a content delivery mechanism I think is far too narrow a definition. Are there other ways that we should be thinking of mobile functionally with the public we serve? Well, there's a, certainly mobile functions differently than desktop. And our data does suggest that, that most people still spend more time with desktop than they do with mobile, even though mobile's growing and that's where sort of the growth is, that people are just in front of a computer more of their day generally. So do spend a little more time there. Uh, for a lot of sites, uh, more of their traffic is still coming through desktop than through mobile. But mobile tells stories in different ways. Um, there's been this question for decades of whether the home page is dead, which is sort of the question of portal. If you say it's dead, then well, it's not. And if you look, it's still the way people like to enter into content in a way. What I think is you've got to offer it a lot of different ways, is that there's got to be content that can be packaged a number of different ways and with, with uh, consciousness of how it will function in that size. Um, I, I was, you know, there was somebody else that I was on a, session, on a panel with a little while back that was talking about um, uh, taking a, a story that was really popular on their, from their desktop users. They had it up on their mobile device and it was getting no traction. And they were trying to figure out why. Well, it doesn't, the answer isn't to just dump it off mobile because it's not working. It's, well, let's think about why it's not working here and how do we, repackage it or, you know, yeah, re rearrange it, repackage it in a way that will be successful. And that's what they did. And then suddenly it was extremely popular through mobile as well. Right. We had time for one or two real quick ones and then we'll we'll voyage. So here and here. Does anybody track the ads that are on local TV, or mostly local TV? Like if you go to an, a an area like we are in New York now and you see like almost of all the local news is almost every other ad is either a campaign commercial or um, a public service commercial from a government agency. Yeah. My question is, is anybody tracking that? And, it, and, and does anybody think that that has a connection to content of the news? Uh, we do not track the advertising. I can say that the um, political ad revenue at, from local TV has risen um, dramatically. And, and in last year's election cycle, um, it was the highest ever. Uh, I should say in 2012's election cycle where it reached the highest levels ever. And part of that was the Supreme Court ruling that allowed, opened up this way of advertising. But um, that revenue is very lucrative for local TV stations. Real quickly, how are you measuring uh, over the top television viewing? So you have digital video viewing, but are you measuring someone who views a video on a smartphone versus a desktop versus through their Xbox in their living room differently, or is that all lumped under digital? Under digital? Um, that's a great question, and it's going to depend on um, uh, who is doing the research. So when we've done sur the survey work, we talk about uh, web-based, online and web-based, which would include, should include those devices as opposed to something that's, a, um, that's not connected to the web in some way. Um, that's one thing, if you're looking at data, it's always good to you know, check and be sure that you know how they've structured the question and what they're gathering and not gathering. Most of those, so like when the e-marketer pulls their stuff off, it would include anything that's in the digital space as well. Uh, so it, sh it should be included in most of the data, at least that I'm sharing with you. All right, a last quick question here. Hi, um, I was wondering if there's been any research done on the prohibitive cost of TV? So as a resident young person, uh, cable TV is just insanely expensive. And I think a lot of people watch TV online because it's free. Um, so I didn't know if anybody's looked at like how that affects people's watching habits. Um, so one of the questions, so you're talking about the cost to the consumer, not the cost to produce? Yes. Is that? Yeah. So um, one of the questions, again, for the, for the last many years has been about cord cutting. So are people cutting off, you know, are people stopping their cable? Uh, and up to last year, and it's something we've been watching pretty closely, it's really mixed. There's not a whole lot of strong evidence that it's happening overall. Uh, now, part of that is because there are, there, is some new, there are some new areas where cable is coming in and people are switching to that kind of, um, uh, that kind of subscribership as opposed to, to not having a cable option. But, um, but among young people, it's, it's less likely that they're going to um, go through that route. So again, it's something to continue watching. Uh, and I think what a lot of cable stations and others that are producing news are trying to figure out how to not find themselves in a bind where most of their audience is getting this in a form that's free. 
Amy, cannot thank you enough. Thank you very, very, very much. And as if we were television, we actually did it on time. Uh, and so we, Amy had a hard out, as you folks like to say. And so thank you very much. Uh, she heads back to Washington. And now we're going to have a big change of pace with ideas, 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 lightning. We're going to smash your heads with ideas and see which ones stick. And over to my colleague, Travis Fox. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Travis Fox. I'm the director of the new visual program here at CUNY. Um, I just started here at CUNY, and I, you know, today kind of reminds me of my first day uh, on the job. I walked in. It was a very early morning. I was walking down the faculty hallway upstairs, and of course, it was dark. You know, it was 9 o'clock, and no one was in except for one office. Light was shining from one office. And I walked down to my office for the first time. There was Jeff Jarvis sitting in his office, um, saw me walk by, and said, Travis, Travis, come in, come in. You remember this, right? He says, I have an idea. I, I have an idea. I have an idea for a conference. It's all about forms. It's all about how technology changes the form of video. Um, and so before I could even go get my coffee, or even take my bag off of my shoulder, um, he told me his idea for this conference. And from that first conversation, uh, laid the basis of everything we're doing here at the school to address these trends. Um, and the one thing I would like to mention here at the school, we started a new course called Video Lab, which is taught by Simon Surowitz and Bob Sasha two of our best professors here. Um, and it is doing what we're about to hear right now. Every week, they are in the process of reinventing video news. So we're all anxiously awaiting the outcome of that class. Um, and we're also anxious to hear all the ideas that we're going to listen to right now. So let's start with Fred Graver. Where are you, Fred? Back here. Back here. Come on up. Fred Graver is the head of television at Twitter. Twitter at television? Please. All right. Um, what happened to the, uh, here's the clicker. Can you hear me okay? Of course you can hear me. I'm a big loud guy. Um, don't start the time yet. I just want to thank Jeff and everybody for inviting me. I don't want to be penalized for being courteous. Um, okay. So, can we have the, can we put the slides up there? Um, ah, okay. This is even better. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so, I, yes, I, I have the, uh, uh, Creative lead at uh, Twitter. We do. This isn't working. There we go. Yeah. No. No. That's the last slide. <laughs> that was wow. really fast. Oh, look we here. Watch. That. It's the sneak preview. Thank you very much. Um, so, so every day we work with networks and 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 producers and showrunners and talent to create great ways to use Twitter and put it together with television. Uh, what Jeff asked me to do is to come in and talk as a TV producer. I've, I've, I've been a TV producer for 30 years. And, and one experiment that I did was a show called Best Week Ever on VH1, where he tried to put the blogging sensibility with, with TV. And the, and the question was, how could you reinvent uh, TV news now in a kind of traditional mode and, and still kind of reinvent the medium? Right? So we've got some problems. Actually, the, the name of this talk is Tell Me Something I Don't Know, because it, the essential problem here is that everybody thinks they already know the news, right? They've seen it on, tw they've, they've read it on Twitter, they've seen it on BuzzFeed, they've gone over all, all the places that Amy was talking about, they've already gone through here. And there's no reason to watch the news. And, and the news audience for TV has changed, right? Nobody under, I think, I think essentially nightly news is a, a delivery system from Odium AD. And, and, and the audience is, I, I read a great phrase, uh, Robert Carroll was being asked when he was going to finish his last volume about Lyndon Johnson. And, and his editor calls him and he says, well, you know, according to the actuarial tables, it should be like next week, <laughs> right? So the audience for TV news is actuarially challenged. And the younger audience, as we've seen, doesn't really watch it. So is there any hope for TV news? But also the other question is, is there really any reason for TV that should be TV news? This, is, gets, this puts me out of a job, by the way. Um, so I have a, pr a proposition that, in fact, TV is still the best way to transmit valuable information to a mass audience. It is still cheap to produce, don't we know it, right? And it still produces a rating. There's 20 million people who watch it, and it still produces ratings. There's a questionable line in this proposition, which is that the TV industry and the TV audience still needs news. But I'm going to take that as a given. Right, that they still need each other. But the, ca the current model is stale or in decline or dying. And the essential question is the question that we all ask in the back of high school, in the back of the classroom in high school every day, do I need to know this? How do I need to know this? Do I need this information? 
And, and the anthropologist Gregory Bateson has a great line, that information is the difference that makes a difference, right? So there's this differential that happens even in the news business, right? The energy of, of uh, gathering the news, the energy of new data comes in, and then there's this whole processing, and then it gets translated into hopefully more powerful energy and torque and stuff that you can actually use. But I think we need to rebuild the differential. I think we need to rethink what it means, what you actually need to know, because the audience does know an awful lot of stuff. And we need to think about new ways of delivering the information. Because all day long, people consume the news. They already voice their opinion about stuff. And by the way, you know, anybody's read Malcolm Gladwell or, or, or anything else, you're like, we form our opinions after about two tweets, right? Because, yeah, we, we know what we're doing. Um, people voice their opinion. Journalists scrambling to uncover the news, distribute it, write about it, process it, trying very hard to stay up, uh, stay, stay up to date, and, and, and to keep up with this, with this insane conversation this insane flow. And ultimately, there is a kind of animosity that is developing. And both sides are looking at the other and going, don't you get it? Why aren't you smarter? Why don't you already know this? Right? And we've all been in those newsrooms where journalists are asking each other, can we, does the audience get this? Why can't they grasp this? Why can't they understand that 97% of, of, of scientists believe that climate change is real? What's wrong? What is wrong? So, Let's embrace the conflict. Let's create a television show that's about that conflict. Who are you to tell me about these things, right? And what attracts viewers on TV, right? So what attracts viewers on TV is, is, is the stuff that's live, that must see, that's, that, that, that's surprising, right? Stuff that are competitions, sports, obviously, awards, things where surprising moments can happen. So why can't the news be like all that other stuff that we really like on TV that captures this conversation back and forth. I present to you the show that I like to call You People. <laughs> <laughs> Every night, it's a show that says, this is what you think you know. This is what we think we know. This is where you're wrong. This is where we're wrong. And there might just be a few right answers. Right? So the best thing about watching, and by the way, I yield to no one in my respect for Fox TV as just pure television. It is so well produced. But it is well produced because there's this great undercurrent, right, of that we know something that they don't know. It's us against them. So why not just pull that out into the open, right? You meet on the battleground. At the center of the battleground is the poor bastard, the embattled anchor. What would, hap what would happen to Brian Williams if he actually had to confront what people were thinking about what he just read? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I think he'd be great at it, right? So sometimes the anchor is wrong, sometimes the crowd is wrong, and vice versa. The conversation is live, and we all know. I don't need to go into what Twitter is or what, what blogging is or what text messaging is, right? The conversation is live, it's real, and it's a life and death search for actual knowledge that you actually have to know. And so you start out over here, you've got the news, you've got the conversation, you've got all this vast data that's, that's put out. You have journalists, the news people who are gathering this stuff. On the set, you have a group of people who are a filter, right? And they've got tools like Jenny's about to show you, where they've got iPads and they're throwing things at the anchor or they're throwing things at the experts or they're throwing other experts via Skype or Gchat or whatever onto the screen. Right? They're filtering all of this stuff. And then you have the anchors who are basically, uh, frankly, they're in wrestling. <laughs> right? <laughs> but they're in wrestling anyway. Let's, let's, let's face it. All right? And the organizing principle for the show is not the standard rundown. It's a bracket. And the bracket is essentially, what do we think we know? What do we think we know? Which one wins out? Which one actually do we finally all agree that there's a bit of fact that we can agree on that might pass on to the next stage. Let's go to the next story. Let's go to the next story. Okay, some people have come in about that story we talked about at the beginning. Now let's, they challenged it this way, and they challenged it this way. And you run it like a bracket because at the very end, you might actually know one or two things that you didn't know before and that you actually understand that you need to know to go forward as a knowledgeable, smart, educated citizen, right? 
it's probably a better batting average than most shows. One or two things that you just need to know. So that's the idea. It's called You People. If you don't like it, I don't know what's wrong with you people. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, we've, we've mentioned to all the speakers that we're limiting these talks to five minutes, which we admit is ridiculous to pitch a whole idea. Um, but we're going to try to move it along as fast as we can. So we're going to do questions at the end. Next up, Jenny Hogan, come on up. She's the chief media officer for Tagboard, which, is, if you don't know, is a technology that um, allows you to consolidate social media and interact between TV and social media. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So I'm Jenny Hogan. I used to be a TV anchor in Seattle, and I really felt the power of the digital savvy viewer. Uh, there will be some slides coming up here. I forgot to get the clicky. Where is the clicky? Fred. Fred, Fred. Fred. So as we get Fred back here, who I uh, idolize and I'm inspired by, so it's great to be following him. Um, I felt this power. I was the most followed journalist in local TV in the nation online with Twitter and Facebook. And my amazing teammates, I call them not viewers, came together with me to do several wonderful things. When the Philippines hit and there was a tsunami, we raised 80,000 water bottles in one day. We filled that truck, hashtag um, we care PH. Over Christmas, we were doing Toys for Tots, the lobby was empty. I did a mobile tweet up where we drove around, live streamed it, and raised six truckloads of toys from my online family. The, at Christmas or winter time, mothers at a local um, shelter had no jackets. So we did Impact Mamas, hashtag Impact Mamas, and in a day we raised enough jackets for all the mums and kids. I won an Emmy for those uh, things, and I have my parents here because they told me to trust my gut and follow it. So I did. I quit being on air. I decided to create technology for other talents so they could feel this power that I'd felt with the digital generation. And so I left. I'm now the chief media officer of Tagboard. I can impact so many more people if I can teach and empower other talent to embrace their digital savvy viewers as much as I could. What I'm hearing as a chief media officer at Tagboard is all these news directors I'm talking to, they're like, Jenny, mobile, the mobile views are beating our website views now, and it's going up crazy every month. The mobile downloads of these apps that we're giving are more in our market than the viewers watching our morning show. We're not monetizing this. How do we monetize this? I drew this in my hotel room. <laughs> Stick figures. Traditional TV is one way. Television stations are telling the viewers the content they want, giving it to them on their couches, or sending it to this mobile app. The digital savvy viewers are so smart. They're our teammates. They're sitting on the couch with their mobile device. They're telling news anchors what they want in stories. Ask these questions. They're going to Twitter for news. They're going to Facebook for news. They're going to their friends, and they're sharing. It's two-way. My husband said to me, the Kim Kardashian app is making $700,000 a day. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to download this app and try work this out. I downloaded it and I was stuck in that app for an hour and I actually paid to get a virtual pair of free shoes. <laughs> I was like, there is something going on here. So my idea is the news, virtual news reality game for newsrooms. What you'd do is you'd have your Kim Kardashian, so a national face that's your friend. They'd guide you through this game. They'd know exactly where you live. Your local news anchors and teams would be in this virtual app. They're going to be your friends. You're going to pick your favorite, and they're going to tip you off and send you alerts on your app, letting you know. For me, it would be, I love the Seahawks, I love technology news, and I love fashion. So I'm going to get tipped off by my local anchor if they're working on any of those stories. I may even be able to tell them questions as they go to interview one of my favorite players. I'm also going to be able to buy clothes for them or dress them or dress myself if I want to become an anchor and share this with all my friends. So my friends could choose to listen to the news that I care about and I can be my local TV anchor. So that's my idea, the virtual mobile app for newsrooms. And I just want to let you know that the digital savvy viewers, from the moment I started on Twitter as a news anchor, we were fourth in the market. And we grew to be the number one most watched local news show in the nation. And I really think that had to do with the digital savvy viewers being able to talk to us, help us develop stories, and influence things we we're doing. Thank you.
Good job. Okay, next up we have Matt Mrozinski. He is the chief photojournalist at WTHR in Indianapolis. And for those of us who don't live in Indianapolis, um, he is the brains behind TVNewsStorytellers.com, which is a great site. We use it here at the school. Our students love it. Matt, reality. Take it away. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, is it on? Can you hear me? All right. So, my idea. Um, basically, First off, how many people here are actually from local TV news? Just show of hands. That's it. I think I counted five people. Mark brought up that question of how many of you are actually from local TV. So I guess I'm kind of on an island here a little bit. But my idea is basically not moving away completely from broadcast, but going 70% digital along with keeping the 30% broadcast. <clears throat> but uh, you don't want to. We don't want to. We want to stop doing newscasts. Start doing shows. I think the folks at Vice actually have a really great idea, and that's something that I think I would want to formulate into my news programs. Um, less news, better. I know the trend right now. <coughs> excuse me. Trend right now is to do, you know, more news, more news, more news. I think the the idea is that what we're doing is packaging a whole lot of garbage. <laughs> um, so let me put this down here. Um, my concept is a hyper-local news service, as in we're giving alerts, we're helping you through the day. Um, and Matt, I think we talked about it a little bit already with Facebook and Google and how they're targeting you with ads. Um, I can see us doing those same exact things with local news. You know, imagine yourself driving down the street and there's an accident, um, you know, a mile ahead of you. You'd want to know that, right? Um, I think there's a, I think there's a great concept there um, for, for us to apply. Um, excuse me. Let's get up my notes. I didn't, wasn't prepared enough to make a thing for everybody. But, um, so there's this term out there called hyper-local glance journalism. I think when Apple came out with their um, watch, uh, we started to see people realize that mobile alerts could possibly be a wave of the future. So um, I kind of, my, my vision kind of is to, as I said, be a, a mobile news service, helping p you get through your day with everything that you want to know. But truthfully, think about news now. You have a fire that happens an hour north of you. Do you really care about that? I don't. But if that happened in my neighborhood, I would want to know that, right? So consistently updating you with this idea that you can tap for more. Tap your watch, tap your phone, tap whatever. And also thinking about, we heard the idea that your, your web page is, is the web page still alive? Well, using the same analytics and whatnot, you could generate a personalized web page. So you have your top three headlines of the day, and then the rest of your content is populated based on analytics, based on you know, whatever, inf the same information Google and Facebook are using. Now, now that we have all of the crap out of the way, because that, that's useful, you know, that's useful information. People still want to know about the fires. They still want to know about the shootings and the little crime things that happen. They just don't want to know about it unless it, it affects you. So, getting to the show, the feel of the show, it has to change completely. I look at E! News. I think E! News actually, their content, while it's not necessarily journalism, the feel of their show, I think, is fantastic. You look at their sets, you look at their people, I think they're able to communicate to a much younger audience like myself. Um, I would, I personally don't want to hear the voice of God, come on, <laughs> and tell me every day, you know, what's happening in the world. I want somebody calm, relaxed, cool, and fun. They can keep things upbeat. So, keeping a feel like that, um, and sticking to this concept of moment-driven storytelling, documentary-style storytelling, because that's, after, after all, that's the key to all of this, right? If people are going to come and watch our content, it's going to have to be good. It's going to have to be exceptional. And we, can, we can't just continue to pump garbage. So I think the folks at Vice really have a, a good thing going. And you could, you could almost go back to everything that he said. It's capturing stories about people in the moment. 
living that world with them and letting you decide sort of what that is. Um, just not actually interviewing folks, but you know, re a reality TV sense. You mic them up, you let them go, and you live their lives with them. Little reporter involvement. Good, and ones that do get the right actually have a good story. So do I have a, <laughs> I don't actually have a name for my show. It was more or less the concept. So 70% digital, 30% broadcast, mobile alerts, getting you through your day, moving, filtering all of that junk news out that we have to watch every day at five o'clock. And, <laughs> and then moment driven, good quality storytelling at 7 a.m. At 5 p.m. and my time is up. So thank you guys very much. All right. Thank you. Next up, we have Adam Davidson, whose voice I think you know from NPR's Planet Money, and whose words you know from his column in the New York Times Magazine. Um, he is going to talk about uh, his pitches. Now I get it. Come on up. Thanks, Travis, and oh no, no, I don't have any. Um, as a radio guy, I appropriately don't have any visuals, and I, I want my main pitch to be just get rid of the pictures, just talk, it's much <laughs> cheaper and easier to do. Um, so uh, I, I was realizing this week is the sixth anniversary of that week when Lehman Brothers collapsed and um, the, uh, basically the global economy died and then was slowly resurrected, which I think of as basically the best week of my life, because um, it was a time where, by total coincidence and accident, Planet Money, this team at NPR, um, was launched. And, and it was this moment when um, this incredibly arcane topic that I had been covering for years, stocks and bonds and financial markets, Federal Reserve policy, was suddenly this vital, powerful um, question that was on everybody's mind uh, in, the, in the country. People desperately wanted to understand, wait, what's happening? Is, does the world I live in make sense anymore, et cetera. And, and what I was incredibly proud of uh, in those early crazy weeks was this now I get it moment, when we were able to do stories <laughs> where um, listeners had been besieged by a sea of acronyms and data and, um, and, and phrases they didn't understand, and we were able to provide them with those moments of, oh, now I get it, now I get it. Um, now that I look back six years later, I think there's something else I'm even prouder about, uh, which is six years later, um, we've maintained sort of this a, a very high level of passion, of passionate curiosity and passionate engagement in our subject matter. And, and I think that that is probably the thing that, that was the hardest to pull off. It was much harder to pull off than just covering an, a breaking financial crisis. It's much harder to do that over the very long term. And so what I wanted to talk about, um, which, which I think is, um, uh, it is is the internal process. How did we create an internal process for maintaining passion, for maintaining curiosity, for maintaining engagement? And early on in the months before Planet Money launched and after it launched, I would have lunch um, every now and then with Jeff and talk a lot about how technology, what, what technology meant for my world, for public radio, for broadcast journalism in general. And, and for me, I mean, I, I love all the Twitter stuff and the interactive, but for me, it, it, the, the, the main disruption in digital distribution is, um, is, it, it is a hearkening back to an old way of relating, that, um, that rather than needing to do stories for Morning Edition or All Things Considered that need to be appealing to 30 million people around the country that need to be appealing in Alabama, and Greenwich Village and Berkeley, California and Texas, um, I'm able to um, create something like Planet Money. We do have a lot of listeners, 1.3 million weekly downloads. It's a big podcast. Um, but those are 1.3 million self-selecting, slightly nerdy, curious people who want to be deeply engaged with us. 
and the public radio business model, which shockingly has become something that other people want to learn about, um, to my mind, the, the fundamental logic of it, which is a very, is, is actually, it's an old kind of stodgy PBS model, but it's also a cutting edge brand new model, which is that we need to create content so compelling, so passionate, that when people look over the previous year, they feel it's worth paying for a service that they get for free. And that model is not about day parts, it's not about um, AQH, it's not about um, short segments, it's about um, passionate engagement. So the thing that we spent the most time on with Planet Money, far more than the content, far more than the storytelling, was creating a, um, a platform internally where every person, every reporter, every editor is able to truly engage their own uh, passion. They're able to self-assign work in a broader context of um, challenge and um, of, of other workers, challenge of, of, of other people on the team challenging them um, to create the work that is um, uh, to, to take that passion and not just make it be personal and idiosyncratic. It's so intimidating looking at Travis. I've spent a lot of time with Travis looking at me in Payback. very, very <laughs> sketchy parts of Haiti with that same look in his face. Um, so I, I lost my train of thought. Basically, it's internal. That's what it is. It's not a bunch of vice presidents coming away from a conference like this saying, we know what TV is going to look like. It's um, empowering the workers, hold, uh, the, the reporter level, the producer level, the editor level, but holding a very high standard at the same time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Adam and I had a chance to reinvent TV when we did co-productions between uh, Planet Money and um, Frontline a couple years back is what he's referring to. Next up, Daniel Eilenberg, who comes to us from Fusion. Thank you for the sandwiches and the drinks. My pleasure. We appreciate that. He is the Chief Digital Officer and Senior Vice President at Fusion. Um, and before that was the founder of Animo Politico, which was Mexico's first Twitter-based news outlet. And he will be talking about how the future of TV will not be on TV. Thank you. So, um, and thanks, Jeff, for the invitation. So let me just start by saying that I know nothing of what I'm about to say to be true. This is all in the future. Um, so probably neither do you, so I think we'll be okay. Um, um, but, but, but these are certainly things that I think um, a lot. I have the privilege of working uh, at a media organization where we have a cable network and we have a pretty strong digital and social presence. Um, and these are some of the things uh, and challenges um, that we're thinking about. Um, and the first thing that I think about when I uh, think about the future of television is we have to realize that news um, consumption and revenue uh, makes up the smallest part of anything else that we do on our televisions. And what that tells me is that probably a lot of the disruption and a lot of the innovation that we're going to see in this space is not going to come from the news divisions. It's probably going to come from entertainment. It's probably going to come from gaming, it's probably gonna come from live sports. And that is not to say that television news will not be completely transformed and that a lot of innovation will happen in that space. It just means that it probably won't be the main driver. Um, so with that in mind, what does the future of television look like? Well, for one, it probably looks a lot smarter. Um, simply the device, the, the, we all probably have smart TVs um, in our homes, but we still control them uh, with something that looks similar to this. And that is a really limited interface to interact with a screen. Um, and at some point, someone will figure out uh, that there's a better way of connecting with our screens. The technologies already exist. Uh, most of the screens that we have at home already could do a lot more than we have them do. Um, but the interface that we use is incredibly limited. Um, and that, at some point, is going to change. And we're gonna start using that screen and interfacing with that screen in a far more similar way than how we interface with our computers and our phones and our tablets. And what that means um, is basically, um, sorry, that we're gonna start doing a lot of the things um, that we do on tablets and on our phones, also on our television. Um, and one of the things that our phones and our tablets and our computers have become really great at um, is communicating, is chatting with each other, is sharing, um, and spending time on social. Um, and I expect um, that we'll probably start using our, our main screen in our homes um, in a fairly similar way. And we'll start doing some of the things that we do on those devices also on our television screen. Um, and what that means, well, one of the main things that we do 
um, is social. Um, and, and when you start uh, uh, being much more social, um, we've seen what's happened to the newspaper industry, we've seen this happen in the magazine industry, and we've seen it happening in the music industry. Content becomes unbundled. Um, what that means is that we start consuming things um, in a very different way. Content becomes atomized and distributed and discovered in a very different way um, than, a f than, than sort of a linear stream uh, from a network. Um, and, and we will probably be sharing this content, we'll be discovering it differently, um, and we'll be consuming it very differently. Um, this is just a slide uh, that I find really uh, quite fascinating. This is media consuming habits um, among high school graduates. And what you'll probably see there is that there's very few media companies. There's actually only one media company, which is BuzzFeed. The rest are platforms, social media platforms. Um, and I expect that we're probably gonna see something very similar happening on television. It's gonna be platform and it's gonna be social. Um, the other thing is it's gonna be personalized. We already have some level of personalization um, in our, in our uh, viewing. Um, shifted viewing video on demand allows us to uh, view things on our own time. Um, but now we're gonna have uh, our circle of friends program our consumption and share their uh, programming. Um, and, and so our programming schedule is probably gonna be programmed by our circle of friends more than people like me, uh, TV executives. Um, the other thing that I'm very excited about, and I don't know how many people here have had a chance to uh, test a virtual reality um, uh, uh, device without getting sick, um, but it's, it's a pretty amazing experience. And we're probably five to eight years from having these devices at home. And again, it won't be news, the main driver of people getting these devices. Um, it'll be something entirely different. It'll be gaming, it'll be live sports, it'll be entertainment. But once people have these things in their homes, there's an amazing opportunity for news organizations to also create um, immersive experiences. And so, so those are some of the things um, that we are thinking about um, at Fusion. I wanted to show you some other slides. Happy to answer some uh, questions later, but I'm getting the evil eye here, and I think the music's going to start any minute. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Th thank, you th thank you for bearing with us on the five-minute rule. Uh, we're, after this session, we're going to have a break, so feel free to track down our guests and follow up with more questions. We just want to have enough time for questions. Next up, Joe Alakata. Where's Joe? Right here. There you are. <laughs> I looked right past you. Um, he is the director of video product at Vox uh, Media, who we all know as Vox.com, and also cites The Verge, um, Curbed, among others. Um, he comes there uh, from ESPN, where he led the team to develop apps for video. Um, he's going to talk about Video Loop today. Great, thanks. And uh, super excited to be here. Um, to be clear, this is a product pitch. There's a lot of awesome creatives in the room. When uh, Hal and Jeff asked me to be here. I said, that's awesome. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to do this, but I'm not, I'm not a creative. I'm a product guy. I'm an engineering guy. Um, I've always built platforms, services, products for uh, folks like Rob's team, uh, who you hear from later, um, uh, analytics at Chartbeat, um, and now building platforms for, uh, uh, for Vox. <coughs> so, you know, as I've worked through my career, really seeing the challenges that um, all of you awesome content creators have had, the, the feedback loop is missing. Um, so you, you, this idea really is, uh, is coming to me around the concept of um, uh, really crowdsourced uh, piloting. So think of the idea around you're putting content out there, there's some analytics, you can understand how it's working, but what, what's really missing is that kind of that feedback loop over the course of the day. Um, so it's where the idea came from around kind of personalized content uh, with publisher feedback in one platform. So both a consumer product uh, and that, that loop for, uh, for all the content creators to seed content out at the beginning of the day. Maybe it's a 30 second clip, maybe it's um, a one minute kind of explainer and really understanding uh, what to create over the course of the day, over the course of the week, over the course of the month. Um, and then really where I'm coming from is packaging that content up um, and pushing it back to the consumers that were the most likely to uh, actually watch that content, the ones that were interested in the, 
the initial things that you pitch, right? So, so it's really hard to say. You can go look at YouTube and see that uh, you know, the Nicki Minaj video is doing incredibly well, or go look at Google News and see that um, there's some crazy you know, Anheuser-Busch lawsuit or something like that. But what you don't understand is you don't know how to reach the audience that, that wants to consume the content that you're actually creating. So by pitching this, this out there through a platform like this, um, understanding the, the magnitude of the potential of the audience, going back, working on uh, a longer form piece, packaging that up with other content uh, dynamically that, that users would actually want to consume, and pushing it back to them um, around the time periods they're most likely to consume it. Think of it uh, around the idea of at the end of the day, you're sitting there with your tablet, you have your giant screen in front of you, like a lot of my colleagues have already mentioned. Um, what if you got a nice package of content that was based on the short form clips that you've watched you know, earlier that week or earlier that day? Um, and you could push it to your Apple TV, you could push it to Roku, you could push it to um, whatever your large, your large screen is. Um, so really, that's the, uh, that's, that's the concept. It's based on analytics. It's based on um, rewarding quality, kind of connecting that loop uh, between you know, the guaranteed interest that your audience has, um, really validating the effort that, that you all are, are, are putting into the content, um, and then supporting, supporting that notion of quality and an audience that you know is interested in the topics that you're, uh, you're creating and, and letting them consume it um, in that nice package and, uh, and knowing that it's going to work for them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sticking with time as well. Next up, we have Adriano Ferraro. Thank you. Um, he is the co-founder of WatchUp, which is a, a great app uh, for your phone, which allows you to um, watch a newscast at any time you want. You don't have to get home at 7 anymore. It's amazing. You can watch it at any time. Is it 6.30? <laughs> that, shows you, that shows you the last time I've watched it. Um, right. Um, and uh, it pulls content from a variety of sources. It's really great. Um, he's going to talk about the digital living room. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So when the Berlin Wall fall was falling down, I was only nine. And uh, here I am sitting on the couch with my parents in a uh, southern Italian home. And uh, my imagination got really captured by the power of video journalism. And that's when I decided I wanted to be a journalist. The next day, I went to school and uh, realized that uh, nobody had really uh, understood what had happened or even heard about it. So I came back home. That's me and started scribbling a small newspaper, as I'm sure most of us in this business have done when we were kids. And uh, the next day, I sold it uh, to my classmates. Uh, I sold it out, and then the teacher came to me. She said, you shouldn't be doing this at school. Uh, here, we are Catholic. You cannot do uh, you know, money in school. So I had to stop. <laughs> But still, uh, you know, then I, I came to Stanford, that was 2010. It was the year the iPad was launched. I came on a night fellowship, and there was this great excitement about tablets and how they were going to uh, revolutionize uh, uh, the news industry. And so here I uh, came with this idea of WatchUp, which truly is about uh, creating a product for news watching, very much like what Netflix or Hulu have done for entertainment. Um, in order to give you all the best news channels into one personalized uh, newscast. So the app is uh, featured by Apple. We just downloaded, we just uh, launched a version for iOS 8. Um, we launched a month ago on Android, and it's also been picked as one of the best uh, from Google Play. The press compares us to Flipboard a little bit for video. And so uh, those are our investors. So really, um, the, the product is all about recreating a news ritual, um, and all those videos play in the background automatically. But let's get to the, the idea for this event. So for me, it's, you know, when I first thought about it, uh, and Hal called me and he asked, hey, why don't you come and tell us something that you haven't done yet to reinvent uh, TV News? I was like, wait a second, we are already reinventing TV News with, with WatchUp. Uh, yes, but we want something new. And so, uh, okay, so we started brainstorming internally, and uh, this is an idea that actually 
goes back to my initial uh, love affair with video journalism. Uh, remember that living room where I was sitting with my parents? So the idea is, can we recreate that uh, experience of being in the same living room and discussing and sharing views about what we are watching, but doing it in a, in a digital environment? And so this is our concept. Uh, so you download the app, and one of the during the onboarding, we would ask you, who are the people whose opinions you really care about it, uh, to the point that to basically invite them to your uh, living room. And then here I am watching a video about uh, uh, yet another uh, uh, volcano erupting uh, in Iceland. And there is this that little uh, button there, living room. So I can start a conversation, because I know that uh, one of my friends is uh, going to, to Reykjavik. And uh, say, hey, bad news, just in time for Hugo's trip to Reykjavik. And then Hugo goes, yeah, my flight is on September 26, fingers crossed. And then there, there is a, a conversation. Okay. I, I keep you. watching. You do. I receive an, um, a notification uh, from Charlie, a very nice Call and uh, funny guy. And he goes, Oops. I'll take you there by boat, man. Don't worry. Um, so, and here's the, basically, you know, our idea, um, and of course it can be about very more uh, uh, serious conversations, of really trying to share and create a social watching experience um, for news. Can I join you guys? Voila, so that's all about us. Again, WatchUp is already reinventing uh, video news. If you have uh, a phone or a tablet, uh, both from iOS or Android, please, please download it now and give us a few stars. Uh, less than six, but more than four. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have um, Fred Sabert. He is uh, the founder of Frederator Studios. I think I know where that name came from. <laughs> um, he has produced animated series for Nickelodeon, for YouTube, and for various devices. Uh, what I was most impressed with his bio was he is the man behind I Want My TV and the man behind the little animated logo from M MTV. So please, and his topic is quit TV and go into video games. So uh, uh, you should feel free to uh, block out the next five minutes. My primary resume has nothing to do with news. Uh, I make cartoons for a living. Uh, I've been doing it online for about 15 years, so I've, I've thought about a lot of things related to your businesses. Um, who is in traditional TV news, you know, traditional media companies? Great, and how many in digital media news? So, here's my premise. Um, you can't reinvent TV news. Uh, because the reinvention of TV news has only really happened a couple of times. One with the invention of TV news, which required the invention of television. And the second time was when cable television reinvented what we thought of as traditional television by reinventing the platform. Platform innovation is what drives these reinventions. And there is virtually no minute, no time, nothing on the platform side of traditional television that's spending any time trying to figure out what it's doing. A few of our guests have already come up with ways that maybe we can modify original television uh, uh, platforms. But you know, in the end, things change because something elemental has changed. And nothing in television elementally has changed in the last 33, five years, you know, something like that. But I spend a lot of time watching my 17-year-old who has abandoned all television with the exception of Survivor, and he watches a lot of video. He doesn't watch it on YouTube, he doesn't watch it on his phone, he doesn't watch on Facebook. He watches video games on Twitch TV. And I've been watching him for two years trying to figure out um, not what he's watching, because I have no interest in video games, like literally zero, but why he is watching. And what I noticed at the very beginning, and it continues to today, is that what they have done at Twitch is they have modified and reinvented the platform of live television. I was in an argument with uh, an analyst the other day who said nobody's interested in live television anymore, they just want on demand. We all know the value of on-demand, but here's the truth. 
we really need live. Fred Graver, in the first thing that we did, he said, we want live, we have to have must-see, we want to know what's going on today. So at Twitch TV, what happens is they basically integrated Fred's business into the traditional businesses that we come from, and they have put live chat involved and in, in, the, uh, in the feed, and that is enough for my son to engage socially. Um, somebody talked about by getting engaged socially, their ratings went up dramatically, but it's all bolted on. And Twitch is the only one that has created an innovation that has put it together and is dedicated to continuing to reinvent the platform. And I think every one of us who is involved in any kind of technology, our camera technology, I've seen some of the students holding this little iPhone thing with a microphone, every one of those little technological innovations changes exactly what we do creatively, journalistically, and our job is to figure out where those new platforms are, screw the business model. Um, the other thing that I've noticed as I've been listening today is everything that we all find interesting didn't have a business model when it started. All of the business people here, I am one of them, is desperately looking for the business solution to the problem. It doesn't start with a business solution. It starts with a creative solution that engages an audience. And if we engage that audience, there's a business solution to be found. Twitter, YouTube, Google, none of them started with a business model. They all felt certain that they could find a business model if people were in love with their product. And I know, you know a lot of us are pressured by the businesses that we're in, we're threatened with being fired, we're threatened with our salaries going down, we're threatened with obsolescence because a 20-year-old is gonna take our job. But the truth is, is that when we find a way to engage the audience, when they fall in love with us, then there will be a business solution and we will all be happy. My son has found it at Twitch. I recommend, if you don't know what Twitch is, go and watch somebody using it, and you will realize there's a solution. Might not be at Twitch, but it's going to be what Twitch has wrought, which is continuing innovation in the platform that will reinvent TV news for all of us and our future. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have David um, Dunkley Gimma. Can I call you Dr. David? Not yet. Soon to be Dr. David. He is a senior lecturer at the Uni University of Westminster. Um, and he's one of the few people who um, was thinking about these topics um, back when I started doing web video at the Washington Post in 1999. A few of the, of the faces that were around then that were thinking about reinventing TV and who are still actively in the, in the business and the, the ideas of reinventing TV. Um, so today he's going to talk about the outer net. Um, can you can you um, continue to talk for three more minutes as I get my Google Glass on, just for the sake that this is going to give me some time feedback and I'm recording this as well. Um, but that will leave you only two minutes of oh, time, right, David. Jesus. Okay, all right, so very quickly, Glass, okay, it's on. Um, okay, uh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't work, take it off. Um, Hi, uh, my name's David, um, are, are we clocking? Okay, um, reinventing TV news, can I, is the thing here? Yes. Um, the last speaker to me really said it all. This is going to be like a Petra Kucha on steroids. Um, how do I get this thing going? Press this. How do I get it going? Uh, push it on the right, the button on the right. Okay, cool. There you all, go. Right, all right, so um, TV news, delivery and style, I'm of the opinion you cannot reinvent news. Thank you. You cannot reinvent news. No, I will rephrase. Every attempt to reinvent news over the years has been news, TV news, assimilating ideas that we've either given to them or they've taken. And, I'm, and uh, I'll quote this one, for instance. In the 60s, Robert Drew, who I had the good pleasure of speaking to as part of my doctorate, he came out with the Oricon. TV News adopted that as part of their ENG. Graphics, over the last 20 years or so, TV News has gradually assimilated new ways of doing graphics. Digital workflows, ENG, all those things, the video wall, if you look back on time, TV News has consistently changed and assimilated ideas from the outside. The question isn't to me about 
TV news and its reinvention. The question seems to be about us on the outside thinking, why are they doing much more than we hoped they would do? In other words, to me, it's about, and this thing isn't coming up now, it's about possession. They run an agenda, and in a way, it doesn't really matter how small they are, because they still control the agenda enough for us to feed into that. The newspapers and the TV, as small as they might be in terms of what Pew was saying, are still heavily influential. Um, so for me, and I can't see this now, it's about the possession of space. It's about the space that TV occupies. Now, I can't go into this in detail, but the point I'm going to make here is very simple. Let's imagine it's 1940s. Oops, let's imagine it's 1940. I come up to you and I go, look, I've got this box. And I'm going to give you this box, and there's going to be some programs on there. And frankly, just have a look, and if you want it, you can buy it. The chances are you're going to say yes. What you don't know is my thought bubble is going, I now have a direct way of talking to you. I am TV news. There's a wonderful quote in Mike Conway's book on CBS where he says, one day, the TV news walked into the 20-somethings news uh, uh, meeting in the morning, and that day they knew the news was at an end. They took control. The idea that today I might come up to you and say to you, here's a box. You're telling me to go away like a salesman. But in the 40s, when they were doing TV news, that's how it happened. So you cannot, in a way, reinvent TV news because that box is a political box. It is my channel to speak to you. It is how my advertisers speak to you. It is my ideolo ideological message. It is a box. I'm not going to relinquish control of that box. So one of the ideas very quickly I have is to go for something called the outnet. This would be a outdoor net screen with imminence big enough to influence me when I come outside my door to say this is my community news. So a huge net screen, there are various things I can't talk about, the sort of te technicals involved, but that would influence the way that that would posit in my head what today's agenda is. And because it's about the community, quite frankly, we could be doing things like Ferguson. Ferguson could have its own internet TV next to the community, and they could be running stories that today's news agendas would take off, but they would still be running. Um, it's social. Um, it's about communities, it's controlled by you. The BBC tried something along the lines of hyperlocal. This would have been ideal for them, and I know they're going to go for something like this in the future. And also, what have I got here? Cinema, future religious, I'm going to go to the next one, style. So the Outernet's one system, very quickly, style. Did anyone see this last week? Uh, this is Michael Moore talking about the first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. The first rule of documentaries is don't make a documentary. Uh, you could change that. I say the first uh, principle of making news is don't talk about news. Make cinema. If you want to make great news in today's field, make cinema. Now, some of you are going to be thinking, James Bayes. Is anyone here a uh, Russian scholar? Any Russian scholars? Vertov? Vertov? Ah, oh, my good man from the BBC. Hello. Hello. No, Sky. Good man. So. Um, Cinema, um, if, 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 you, if you have the opportunity to look back on time, cinema has nothing to do with fictional films. It has everything to do with a specificity of vision and the way we tell stories. The fact that if I stand here and deliver this seminar in this way is one convention. If I start roaming about and doing things different and breaking the rules because the need arises, I am creating what you call cinema. Um, Soderbergh is a very good person in this. Very quickly, I'm going to end here. This is the news package. This is the form, more or less, that we tell stories at. And it has stayed like that for the last 50 years, more or less. This here is an extract from one of the uh, broadcast magazines from about 20 years ago. They know it's boring. This is the woman who, very quickly, her name is Dorothy Greenfield-Williams. I've got to say thank you. And she was responsible for the way we do news today. And very quickly, the reason why that is is that she didn't like cinema, and she thought documentary was too expensive. And that's how I've got to end, because this five minutes Petra Kucha is just <laughs> something else. Cool. All right, thank you. Thank you. We can, um, we can come back during the question time. Oh, okay. we, we, we have time for that. Um, OK, next up, last up in this session, before question time and our break, is Tom Keane, who's the, um, he's an editor-at-large at Bloomberg News and who hosts the, uh, the show on Bloomberg Television called Bloomberg Surveillance. Um, and he's going to talk about the conversation. Please. Yes. I'm, I'm going to give you these. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, I got it. I got the plot. 
Uh, Jeff said I could do this if I could only sleep three hours. We succeeded. I'd like to thank the people of Scotland. It's been a, a, a really amazing 24 hours. I'll go quickly. Uh, these are, of course, my own comments, and not those of Justin Smith, Josh Topolsky, who you know, and Josh Terangle. Um, it, it is a fascinating you. time. You are all TV pros. I'm told hourly at Bloomberg I'm not. Um, or on radio, for that matter. Uh, but I've been putting together a slew of memos that would make Jeff happy on where we're going, where the industry's going. And as we heard from Pew earlier, I'm a huge believer in the Edelman Trust Barometer, Pew's Research, Annenberg, and um, others. As anybody that knows me knows my number one thing is velocity. Uh, voice of God is dead. We all know that. But I just can't say enough whether it's a panel at Davos where I met Jeff or it's in New York or wherever you go, the audience wants it faster. I, I can't begin to convey this. I deal with media people each and every day that don't get this. They want it faster. We learned it on radio. It's slowly coming over uh, to TV. And as again, as many of the people here have said, uh, it, it is an, an entrenched conservative industry that hates change. What have we learned? Here's the number one thing we learned in nine years. When we did the original research, we were like, yeah, let's do it again. We did it again, yeah. Let's do it again. About the third time we started paying attention, and you heard, you saw actual slides from Pew that completely voiced this. All they want is a conversation. That's the type one construct. On a statistical basis, the major headline is not that they want a conversation. The type two construct, which we didn't believe for years, they want nothing else. We tested this and tested this and tested it. I'm sorry, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings. I didn't invent this. I give Bill Keller at the New York Times full credit for this phrase, conversation. That's what they want, and that's what we try to do every second of the, of the day. One of the splits here is, and I got screamed at at any number of dinners with some of our good competitors about this, TV is still star or anchor centric. I'm death on that. I'm totally guest centric. And that's, that's why the, rela the relationship that I have with people, et cetera. And that's something that's going to be really interesting in the next five years to see where that goes. TV is still doing, you know, and, and they're great people. I mean, I, I adore Anderson Cooper's work. He does two interviews. He does Anderson Cooper talking to CNN people, and then he does Anderson talking to people like I talk to people. And you could hear the difference in his voice where he switches from a typical interview to a guest-centric conversation. And of course, that's what I'm trying to do every day. And we've got the practice. Radio, by the way, a break exclusive. Is Adam still here? Yeah, break exclusive. They're going to kill me for this. Save me. Radio is dramatically harder to do than TV. Radio is like snowboarding versus skiing. You're naked. You're up on edges. All you got is a damn mic, and that's it. It's much harder. So between radio and TV, What's transportable is this idea of conver uh, conversation. Um, another idea that's a raging debate at Bloomberg, packages. We produce. TV people love to say, we produce. I don't give a damn. I'll tell you why. And, and I think packages are great. Don't get me wrong. I have yet to have anyone anecdotally in the real world tell me they like packages. I'm waiting. TV people like to tell other TV people that they like packages. And they do one minute, they do TV, they do, they, do, uh, they, do, they do packages for each other and back and forth. I'm waiting. What they want is a conversation, as you beautifully saw in the Pew slide, and that's where the metrics go on. Do they work? Yeah, every once in a while packages uh, work. But it, it's, it's very, very uh, challenging with that. I want to talk about the younger viewer. When we went to Bloomberg Surveillance in the morning on radio, we doubled the demo in two weeks. We did not expect that. I had every shit stereotype that everybody in this room has. Old farts, you know, every stereotype you have. And I, I, I remember the other day on Dylan Radigan over uh, at our good competitors at CNBC how he changed 5 p.m. It takes courage to change things. We didn't think we'd get the young demo with surveillance in the morning on radio. It doubled overnight. I didn't expect that. As we heard earlier from someone, do not emphasize how desperate 
younger viewers are for smart. The first international email I got was from a 17-year-old kid in Vietnam who listened every night like religion. Yeah, every night, because it was morning. Thanks, T thanks, I'm done. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Tom Keen from Bloomberg. We appreciate that. Now we've come to the end of the first round. Thank you for your patience with the lightning round. We're going to do uh, some questions for 15 minutes, and then we're going to break at three. Who wants to start off Question on questions? Uh, I'll come around with the mic, Jeff Jarvis style. Who's starting? Okay, you're going to make me start off, aren't you? Okay, I have a question for Adam. So Adam's pitch, your pitch was more or less taking the model from Planet Money, which has been so successful, and applying it to TV. I'm generalizing. Um, this is a personal question. We tried that, more or less. Uh, and there's been many attempts at taking radio and everything we love about radio and transforming it into TV, This American Life, among others. Why have none of those really been that successful? And how would your idea be successful visually? Sure. And so I, I feel like, for me, I mean, you and I tried very hard to, to do this for Frontline and, and This American Life. The radio show did a two seasons, uh, or three seasons, two and a half seasons for Showtime. And um, I think there is a different economics. Radio is very cheap. You know, uh, I, I agree with Tom that we are far superior to you people. But, um, but it is, uh, you know, we just have a thousand bucks worth of um, uh, recording equipment and we can go anywhere in the world and we don't have, you know, union crews and all, all that stuff. So the, there is, when I've done TV, all the pre-production you have to do. I mean, it, it's no big deal to send a radio reporter pretty much anywhere in the world and just say, well, hopefully you'll get some stuff. And we don't have to think what time of day it is or, um, or you know, do, do we have things lined up so, so that we're efficient. So I, I actually have no idea how to deal with that. That's not saying I can answer. What, what I do see, though, and, and maybe it's inherent, I don't think it is, is that um, the TV I've worked on, and this was certainly true with Frontline, we found out, um, is, um, and maybe it's because of the economics, but there, there's a risk aversion um, that, that requires kind of an approval culture uh, very high up, up the chain. And, and I would imagine that on any one given project, that might make sense, that, that you, you want to be efficient and you, you don't want to waste a lot of money. But overall, I think that squelches creativity and passion. Um, I mean, I think you and I could say we both love Frontline and love all the people at Frontline, but we started that project with a lot of passion and we ended that project with very little <laughs> passion and a lot of exhaustion I'm and frustration. I'm not going to go on the record and say that. Yeah. We went to Haiti and did a bunch of stories about why is Haiti poor, and, um, and, and it was... Uh, um, and what ended up happening, as, as happens very often and happens at NPR and other places, is the creative decisions. We were a very good team in that I had a lot of local knowledge and economic knowledge, but maybe too much and I was too inside. And you had an outsider, you know, smart, naive curiosity, and we kind of teamed together. I think that's a classically great reporting team. Um, and we were fueled by energy and passion, but then there was a, a, an approval culture that I think exists in most large media organizations that um, that allowed uh, a bunch of vetoes throughout the organization and 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 allowed a, devolved a lot of the decision making to people who are the farthest away from the kind of passionate on the ground um, feeling. So. Um, Vice try to keep the voice. What does that leech exactly? What does that system not like? The the bureaucracy. The, the bureaucracy. What what does it like? What does it leech out? Um, I I think that it, um, it the I can speak to NPR, which is um, and, and I think Frontline was quite similar. I've done uh, uh, um, the New York Times is not too dissimilar. That there's there's a standardization that comes in from. Uh, when you have an approval culture, when you have um, reporters on the ground who have a lot of time to deal with one subject matter, and then you have managers high up who have very little time to deal with a lot of subject matters, the bandwidth of information, and, um, and not just information about the story, but information about the content of the story, the structure of the story, the form of the story, has to be narrowed very much because just time, like if you're a senior editor, you just have so many seconds a day per, for each story. 
So any experimental or creative ideas that the reporters in the field have have to be conveyed in like half a sentence. It's kind of like this conference. And, um, <laughs> and, and so you're, you're inherently presenting things to the senior manager has to make a decision in a distorted, narrowed, panicky form, kind of like I'm doing right now. <laughs> and, um, and so it's just easier for them to say no. And so what, what I find is effective, although it's risky and scary and, and involves failure, is uh, you know, having a team you trust, devolving those decisions to the local folks. I think you would find in many um, for-profit businesses that aren't in, you know, and that, that other kinds of businesses, there's a lot of that. That's a big um, buzzword in, in management, is devolving decisions to the people closest to the problem. So. I don't, I don't have a pitch on like how this will look because specifically, I don't think there should be a pitch on how this would look. All it would be is being more risk averse. There, there's a concept in manufacturing that if every machine is efficient, then by necessity the system is inefficient. And you need to allow, um, uh, and, and that's a long story which I won't get into, but um, I, th I think that might be like a basic lesson that like Toyota knows that TV news doesn't know. That if each product, each, each individual unit, each piece, each day's show is economically efficient, you know, we, we've taken out the risk that someone's going to fly to Japan and have a crew and, and is going to waste a lot of money. So we've eliminated that risk. So we're not going to lose, you know, that $3,000 or $8,000 or whatever. B by definition, the system as a whole is inefficient. So I guess that, um, I feel like I'm not doing the best job of explaining it, but I guess embracing risk. That, the, that, that is the, the basic idea. Great, thank you. Hey, I have a question for Adriano. Um, I don't know, is he still here? Come on up. Oh, there we go. Come on up. Um, so I really, I really like the idea of, of you know, this sort of um, living room uh, environment where you talk to people that you actually care about. Um, but what it made me think of, you know, sometimes there are different people um, whose opinion I care about. So I might want to know what, you know, my mom says on, I don't know, some social event or whatever. But um, when I'm interested in something like the Alibaba IPO, I, I would kind of want to know, um, you know what people in, in the financial industry think about that, people I might not even know personally. How do you incorporate, incorporate that into your, uh, into your idea? So the, the idea actually uh, came to us when we were talking to uh, one of our users who told us about how deep and engaging it was um, having a conversation while watching the news with his dad while he was growing up, and now, the two of them were living in two different cities, and he was missing that, uh, that experience. So um, I guess the, the idea is really to go back to that intimate exchange between people that, uh, with people that uh, you really care about. Um, so, you know, again, those are, I guess, just like for everybody, ideas that we don't really know whether, you know, one day we're gonna do them or not, and, uh, you know, these kind of conversations are actually inspiring um, for us. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, at this point, it's a clean slate, and uh, I appreciate the feedback because it's true. You might want to need um, a different level of uh, interaction with people with whom maybe you are not that close, but who can still contribute to that uh, exchange. So thank you. So right now, it's really only people that you already know? Uh, right now, it's a clean slate, I would say. But the initial idea is to recreate that living room interaction with uh, very intimate with people uh, who are close to you. But why not to open up? OK. Yeah, so one over here or one over there? Yeah, Saul, I think you, you had your hand up. I'm interested in, in Fred Graver's proposal, um, which I thought was really fascinating um, on the thought of, you know, the re engaging head on with the fact that nobody believes what they read and that in this crazy world, you know, truth is a very elusive commodity. And you mix that with the insight about what makes for dramatic television and pulling from reality TV. My, my question is, 
if reality TV has nothing to do with reality, it is reconstruct, you know, just like worldwide wrestling has nothing to do with sports. It is constructed to the television to make a narrative. And if you want to believe at some level that this is going to lead to insight and truth and trust, how much of the conventions that the medium of television imposes on reality can you really do before it's fundamentally distorting? There's a complicated bunch of layers there, right? My, my, my first response is, as a kind of a TV producer is to say, yes, all TV is phony. You know, get over yourself, right? Okay. And that, that part of the problem of having, or part of the solution of having a show called You People is basically saying that you're saying that to the audience, get over yourselves. Yes, this is, as, as you know, Adam was pointing out, this is a package, right? This is something we've produced. You get it, right? And most people are, are, have become very savvy about that. And then the other side of it is the audience saying, why did you package it this way? Why are you selling it to me in this way? You know, isn't there some other truth? And I think actually, you know, the, the, the format of a show like that, what you're going to end up doing, and, and, and you know, any, any form that has become kind of really revolutionary, right? So if you take what Letterman did with with the with late night when he first started right it was just peel back the layers peel back the layers half of the fun of the show was peeling back the layers when reality tv first started when you think about uh, real world right real world peeled back the layers if you look at real world right now it looks like elevator footage right mm -hmm. right but that was part of the charm of it and then it got more and more produced so i think the evolution of the show if you're really honest about going back and forth between the audience and the audience challenging you and then you, you put that on one part of the, the screen. And I would say that probably becomes the online discussion, right? Can I believe you, right? The, the, the on-air discussion that's entertaining becomes the distillation of that and the production of that, of that conversation, right? But I think ultimately it does create a completely different form of television if, if you're good at it. I mean, I love the idea, I, but I, I think it's very interesting. Yeah. OK, who else? David. Was there? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Steve Weiss from the Jewish Channel. Uh, Jim, I was really intrigued by your comment about don't at underestimate uh, the desire of younger viewers uh, for, for something smart. And I think that speaks to a lot of the themes that we saw today. Yeah. And. Uh, Where's my what? You got my name wrong. You know, where's uh, my public relations? They got my name wrong. <laughs> that Jim on the screen. That's I, okay. I only know what I Jim on the screen? screen I'm a Come on, Jeff. All right. Everybody knows you, Tom. So, so uh, within that, though, when you switched to radio and you said, well, radio was a medium where we could meet these smarter uh, listeners and, uh, and double our audience, when I'm producing my newscast, thinking about my newscast, I'm often thinking about how do we not get viewers to shut off? And when do we not put something to make people shut off? And I wonder about your TV product, if I compare your TV product to, say, CNBC's TV product and the graphics and so on. You never want to do that. But the graphics and so on and so forth. I'm wondering, is there, is, is that part of the solution that when you say, well, where can I find my level playing field? Where I'm not going to beat CNBC at graphics and studio and so forth, but I can beat them with smarter. And then can I find a medium where I'm only competing with people where I'm on a level yeah, playing th field? There's a number of ideas there. Uh, first of all, one of the great statistics I saw when we invented Bloomberg on the economy was Howard Stern loses a third of his audience every time he goes to break. And I begged and begged and begged Bloomberg Radio to do what Don Imus invented, which was do billboards, where I voice them on radio. I now see that permeating sports television right now. I mean, you know, the third baseman does something and they have to do an ad over it. Uh, so that whole search for revenue within everybody turns away on a break is a huge deal. I'm acutely sensitive to that uh, because of radio. But I think within the battle of smart, and this is something that Justin Smith and I have gone back and back and back and forth on, and we totally agree with the idea, him coming from The Economist and The Atlantic, and that is smart wins. There are three audiences for that smart, and that's the battle. And you know, everybody in the room has a different audience. Mine are Global Wall Street, a very sophisticated non-global Wall Street. They're called investment pros. I call them Wall Street wannabe. And then there's an audience I didn't know existed in 2003, 
And the first time I knew it was a doctor had a heart attack north of New York City, and his uh, uh, daughter told me, they go in the hospital, Dad, you're going to live, yeah, great, 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 what do you want? I want a radio so I can hear Bloomberg on the economy. That was the first moment where there was like this professional class audience that we didn't know was out there desperate for smart. And I see this in the industry. It's getting better. It's, it's definitely improving every year. But the trick is, in my world, how do I please all three of those three audiences at any given moment? Today I did a chart on Yen Wan. The doctor in Poughkeepsie doesn't care about that. How do you make that interesting? And I think that's the battle that so much of television's having as they try to figure out what to do away from the traditional mode is, A, identify smart. How do you get it with velocity through the moment? And then I think the critical thing is how do you keep your various identified audiences? The other thing to do, which I see uh, uh, so many TV people just are completely opposite of me on this, you have to identify audiences you will not speak to. There is this delusion of going for a lower common denominator audience and somehow magically the 28-year-old PhD candidate in biochemistry in Colorado is going to listen to it. I see no, I see, you're the pro at this, I see no proof of that. Did I go too long? No. Okay. But I hope that helps. How do I do on velocity? For the first six months I was on radio and a lot of what I do is based off the velocity of Chris Matthews at Hardball. I would go, am I talking too fast? Am I talking too fast? And everybody would say no. And yet we have people on air that, don't, that talk too fast and you can't understand a damn word they're saying. And so the answer is Howard Ross, who was my voice coach. And the answer is you can talk fast and get things going like this within a conversation. Think morning, Joe. Think of my good friend Jim Cramer, you can get this going. If you have diction, the best, who has the best diction in television? Who has the best diction? You, this is really important. You have to look at people's teeth on air. I'm serious, you do. This absolute hands down best diction on TV is Keith Overman. Nobody's close, why? Because he had to sit there in Boston and I would watch him doing baseball scores. Try to do it sometime. I can't do it. Overman is by far and away the best diction I've ever seen on TV. Because he had to go, you know, Red Sox three, tie, and make it interesting. But, but that, that idea of velocity is to keep it going. And it works, I'm not saying it works in every genre, but within what we do it does. Thank you. Going to a question over here next. Hi, my name is uh, Gypti, and this is for Jenny. I really enjoyed, um, your proposal about um, hashtagging. A lot of digital media nowadays uses social media and the importance for reporters to incorporate social media into their daily storytelling is all the more important. I come from a hyper-local news uh, organization. How, I'm curious to know firstly, how did you make that work for you? Because it's easier said than done when you have a hashtag and you've got a story. Hello. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I'm from Australia. I have an Aussie accent. Most of hyperlocal news is very American accent. They're all the same. Um, people email the news station. Usually when they don't like things, they wake up in the morning grumpy. So we get a lot of emails about I was saying words wrong. I was actually the most emailed person in the morning show because I would say words that didn't sound right. Um, before social media, I started an Excel spreadsheet of everyone that emailed me, and I'd email back to them. I'd say, what word is it? And I'd sit with my husband and practice, and I started to create a community. I got to know them, their kids, things about them, that their dog had cancer. So when I started looking at the TV screen, I could see these viewers, and it made my job so much more beneficial to me than just the one way looking at this camera that's a robot. At the time, we didn't even have floor directors. Um, when Twitter came along, I had a few thousand at that point. I actually got stolen by another station and lost my community because my community was my email address, which was my TV station's address. So I got stolen. I put in my contract, I want to own my community. It was before social media. And they were like, sure, own your community. Um, then Twitter started, and the next day I had a few hundred followers. It grew to a few thousand. But these were my people that I already knew. 
So I started treating Twitter how I treated my emails, but all of a sudden it wasn't private, it was public. So my advice to all of you is your community is 24-7. I tweet, I post, I talk to them all the time. I'd watch other anchors and talent stop as soon as they left. Uh, social media, to really get the most out of it. I mean, I get tips. When President Obama was in town, my handle was the number one most trending handle in Seattle because I was talking about it and following along communication over all the news organizations. So I was listening to my community, seeing what they cared about, and I would just participate in the conversation. Same thing on Seahawks game day. My community loves the Seahawks. I participate in that. That's my off work hours as a journalist. But I am caring about conversations that they care about. The amount of direct messages of breaking news stories that we'd get through my Twitter handle, because these are my friends, they wanted to tell a friend, helped my station so much. So that's just my advice is these are your friends. And it's so powerful. I really don't think TV news is dead. I think it's more powerful than ever. And if we can embrace this social media, teammates rather than viewers, there's something really huge here. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. David, one, one last question for David. Uh, thank you. Uh, the message to Trump. Trump? Trump? Let's switch. Uh, this is a question for Tom. But first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, your good self, Jeff, and Hal, and everyone here for inviting me over. Um, first, can I have make an assumption? Is the assumption that when young people grow up, that somehow they won't be into news. It's a, it's a naive assumption, but I ask that on the basis that when they become adults and they need to know about their mortgages, et cetera. And then the question, therefore, I want to put to you, and you talked about the package. In the 60s, the, the package was revered. It was this construct that allowed them to say complex things very mm -hmm. easily. And over the years, it hasn't moved, and that's why it's become tired. Where do you see it going? Because in front of me, very quickly, is this man called Brian from Leeds of Storm, who is doing things which the BBC reveres greatly in right. the way he tells stories. Well, we're thrilled to have Claudia Mill join us as well from uh, the BBC in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the packages you talk about are dead. I, I believe there can be a new package if they avoid one word, and that's teachy. I, I, I once had a major, major famous TV executive almost take a swing at me because I told him, I said, hey, your garbage is teachy. Teachy to our audience is death. A third of the audience is dramatically smarter than anybody in media, flat out. Another third of the audience thinks they are, even if they aren't. <laughs> They're the worst audience, by the way. And another third of the audience really wants to learn. And the problem with packages in their slow motion, old style pace is they become teachy, almost to the point of preachy, depending on what the theme is. And we're always, how do you explain Janet Yellen and monetary policy without being teachy? We had a thing today, I don't know what we were talking about, foreign exchange or whatever, and we brought it over to eight blocks of people lined up outside the Apple store. So within the live conversation, you're always trying to pull it back to a basic idea. I really think you have to do the same thing in whatever the new package is, and I'm, not, I'm by no means an expert on that. But this, this phrase teachy is just death, and I see it constantly. The other thing I see is I see great video, and the script is written like eighth grade. My, uh, you guys are the pros. I may be wrong on that. But constantly I see that, where it's a dumbed-down script wrapped against killer video. And, and that, to me, and I think the British, frankly, do this much better than we do, all in all, because it's a whole smarter, it's a whole smarter construct over there. The, the ever. I did a book tour in um, the US, and then a week later I was in London on whatever street that is where all the bookstores are, and it might as well be another planet. You know, it's seriously, with, with all great respect. Up at 315, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank Feelings. you. Very. Thank you, Tom. Uh, if you have any more questions, just approach the panelists directly. We're going to go straight into break now. You've been very patient. We appreciate it. We're going to reconvene at 315.